This is uh, from the Mount of Olives. I did not take either of the pictures I'll show you, but this is, uh, this is a low grain, low uh, quality picture, but I'll show you a higher quality one next, just to give you kind of an idea. When Jesus is standing on the Mount of Olives and he is giving the discourse about the destruction of Jerusalem, the fall of the temple, this is what he's looking at. Wow. And the Dome of the Rock, which is here, um, is where the temple would have stood. So you saw that miniature. Um, this is still that retaining wall that was built in the time of Herod 2,000 years ago. Um, and that stretches all the way across here, right? And so this is still the original retaining wall. Now the wall is not the original, but the retaining wall down here is the original. Okay. Um, so there is a, because inside of here, it's not actually filled like a retaining wall, it's built with a bunch of arches, so it's actually hollow, like inside of there, it's just built with supporting arches inside of there. And the base stones inside of there, there is one base stone that is the size of a school bus. And like nobody knows how they got it there. Because the quarry is miles away from Jerusalem. So anyways, for what it's worth. Um, the Garden of Gethsemane um, is thought to be down, at, or is down in the Kidron Valley. I don't know exactly where it was, but this is around the area where Jesus was arrested. So here's a more high quality picture. And you can kind of see that original retaining wall here and overlooking Jerusalem. This is shot from the Mount of Olives. So all of this is the original temple precincts. Um, <clears throat> the main entrance into the temple is by, via these stairs right here. That was the original entrance. Now that has been walled up by the Muslims and is used as a, was used as a defensive wall during the Crusades, but um, the original doors to enter the temple are right at the top of these stairs. Right. There you go. So, anyways. All right. So, it gives a little bit more context for this picture. <laughs> okay. So, the Gospel of Luke. Um, yesterday, we went through a lot of the BRI. Thank you very much. And we looked at the literature. We looked at what Luke is doing. We talked about the background of this book. Um, and I just want to see if there's any questions after yesterday, after you've been going through the book or anything that you guys have had questions about in the book that you're hoping will get covered. Since you've been working on PTs, you've done your out loud, is there anything you're like, oh, I wonder about this passage, or this passage was confusing? I was looking last night about, you just said that uh, Luke was a Gentile, so I was kind of looking that up when I heard that. And there's also an opposing view that he was Hellenistic Jew. Yeah. Um, I think there is a potential with that. Um, the reason that most people land on Gentile is Colossians 4. And so we can look over at Colossians 4 very briefly. <clears throat> and what Paul does is he makes a list of his fellow workers, starting in verse 10. And then in verse 11, he'll make this statement, These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So that's verse, that's verse 11. So Paul makes a short list of people who are among the circumcision of whom we have um, Aristarchus, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, who we know very clearly was a Jew. Um, we have another person named um, uh, Jesus who is called Justice. And then Paul says, these are the, as of right now, these are the only men among the circumcision. And then Paul will make a list of people who we see as being Gentile. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus. Then we get down to verse 14 where it says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Um, and so we have these other people who are listed outside of the circumcision group. Now, that could lead to this idea that maybe Luke is a Hellenistic Jew, but the fact that he's uncircumcised um, would have been something that would have been a huge tarnish on his reputation as a Jew if he was a Jew. Now, if he was a Gentile who was a attending synagogue as a God-fearer, then he may not have been circumcised. But it doesn't make him a Jew by blood. So that's what my argument would be on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Do we know if Luke was a Roman citizen? We don't know. Okay. Yeah, not sure on that. Um, I don't see why not. Um, given kind of his status uh, in life, but 
yeah, we don't know. All right, so we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke today. We're going to get through hopefully about half of the Gospel, but we're also going to talk about parables today. We're going to talk about the topic of prayer a little bit and um, some things as we go along with the book of Luke. Now, I'm not going to talk about everything in the book of Luke. We, it is an enormous book. It is the longest book in the New Testament, and so we just don't have the time to talk about every single thing. So mostly what I'm going to do is highlight the key things and a lot of things that are unique to Luke um, and then various points as we go along, but I may skip over something. So if you have something that you wanted to look at or had a question about, then please do ask that as we go along. But as we get started here, I want to think about and ask this question to you, what is the kingdom of God? What, what is the kingdom of God? Uh, When we think about the kingdom of God, when we have read about it here, what are some of the things that mark the kingdom of God? And I want you to um, take a moment to talk with the person next to you and just discuss what is the kingdom of God. And don't just say what you think the kingdom of God is. Try to use what you know from scripture to talk about what the kingdom of God is. Because we don't want to just spout off our good ideas of what we think God's kingdom is. We want to know what is the what is the kingdom according to scripture. So take a couple minutes, talk to the person next to you, just discuss some ideas of what is the kingdom of God. I'm like, 
All right. Let's uh, start to get some thoughts from you guys. Like to hear what a, what have you guys talked about? What is the kingdom of God? What were you guys talking about? Everybody was talking. <laughs> Some good thoughts there. Well, in scripture, when it talks about entering the kingdom of God, it always is in a context of being redeemed, being changed, being reborn. So obviously, it is a place where their sin is not accepted, you can't be sinful and be in that place. So that would indicate the presence of God, and I would think the heavenly beings, mm -hmm. whatever those might be. Sure, yeah. Good. It's a, it is an important topic for us to think about because it's mentioned so frequently. In the Gospels, Jesus mentions the kingdom of God 126 times. <laughs> it's a lot, right? In four books, and mostly in Matthew, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is mentioned 126 times in these four books. In the rest of the New Testament, do you know how many times it's mentioned? <clears throat> 16. Okay, so out of 27 books, it's mentioned 126 times in four, and then in 23 books, it's mentioned 16 times. 14 of those times are by Paul. Okay, so in 13 books, it's mentioned 14 times, and then it is used by Paul one-third of that time, so about five times in one book alone, 1 Corinthians. So it is very <laughs> infrequently mentioned in other books. So it's an important topic for us to consider and us to think about. Now, when we think about uh, the kingdom of God, that is probably a possessive statement. Right? God's kingdom would be another way that you could write it. Right? This is the way it is in God's kingdom, would be how Jesus might say something. Right? Um, and so when we think about it, think about the kingdom of God, this simplest way for us to think about it would be this is the place where God is king. Right? Now, in that simplest definition of this is the place where God is king, now you want to know, okay, what does God expect in his kingdom? Because every king has expectations of how his subjects are supposed to live. Right? How they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to treat one another, what they're supposed to do. Right? If you think back to nobility, right? and they have, they have serfs and peasants in their kingdom, they have a certain expectation of how they're supposed to live, of how they're supposed to act and uh, go about their um, careers and life paths and things like that. So in God's kingdom, we think of it uh, as kind of the whole earth, right? as God's kingdom. But there has been a rebellion in God's kingdom, right? And part of what Jesus did in sending out the 12 and sending out the 72 is to correct people's lifestyle in God's kingdom. So that man, when that king comes out of his castle and he comes to his kingdom and sets everything right, will he find that his kingdom is in order or will he find that it's an incredible rebellion? Right. And so we'll look at what kind of God expe God's expectation of the kingdom is and how Jesus talks about the kingdom because there's a lot to observe about it. So it's something good to think about because 
if somebody came up to you on the street today and asked you, what is the kingdom of God? You could maybe say a lot of your own thoughts, but can you say what the scriptures say about the kingdom of God, right? And it would be the same thing about some random person comes up and asks you, you know, what is righteousness? You know, Christians talk about that all the time. What is righteousness? You know, and, and thinking about that. So when you get into Romans in two weeks, it's a good thing to think about, right? What is righteousness? So um, these type of topics are important for us to consider as we get into the into the New Testament, into the words of Jesus. So we'll look at the kingdom of God, um, especially in Luke. He highlights it in a very particular portion of the book, and so we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there today. Um, so this is kind of our roadmap for today. We're going to look at chapters 1 through 9, and then we're going to talk about prayer and parables. We'll do some work with parables, and then we'll look at chapters 10 through 15. So we had left off, um, about to start the book yesterday, and we had jumped into the first paragraph of the book and spent some time in there, but we're going to look at chapter 1 now and these stories and what God is doing and what Luke is doing in putting these stories together. So the first stories, the, the first few chapters of Luke are actually quite unique. Nobody else includes this information. It's just Luke who does. And he's starting by laying the groundwork for the narrative that he's going to tell. And so he's giving a good baseline for the story. And what he does is starts with two sets of couplets. Okay, and couplets are two stories that resemble one another, kind of in order. So we have first Zechariah and then Mary. And then we have the Song of Mary and the Song of Zechariah. And so these are what are referred to literarily as couplets. And they're supposed to parallel each other or compare to each other in some ways. And so what we see is we have Mary who exemplifies faith and trust in God and Zechariah who exemplifies doubt, right? And with Mary, she's given a confirmation of what will happen, and Zechariah is given a confirmation and made mute. So we have this um, Zechariah's doubt compared to Mary's faith, and then Mary's song of blessing then compared to Zechariah's song of blessing. Now, when we think of Zechariah and Elizabeth, are these young, vigorous people? No. <laughs> right? They're old. Right, Zechariah is old. Elizabeth seems to maybe be too old to have children anymore. And who should that remind us of? Sarah, Sarah. Sarah and Abraham. Good. Right. So Luke is starting with comparisons to what God has done in the past in bringing the promised children of Israel. Okay. So we want to kind of make these parallels. We could see this also like Hannah and Samuel, where Hannah is crying out for this child. Now, Zechariah is in the temple burning incense in chapter 1, which is something that a priest at this point in time would only get to do once in their lifetime. There were so many priests that worked at the temple and that operated in various um, times of the year that usually a priest would only get to burn incense once in their lifetime. Now, priests were doing it every day, multiple times a day, but there's just so many of them. So, um, Zechariah goes in to burn incense and the angel Gabriel shows up um, to him and tells him about the son. Now, Zechariah doubts. And you see that kind of in his question. And we'll compare this with Mary's question here in a little bit because they resemble each other quite closely, but with key differences. So <clears throat> Zechariah doubts, and this angel makes him mute for a time. While he comes out of the temple, of course, we see... Um, that everybody is shocked by what he has seen, and he expresses him having seen this angel, but he ends up going home, Elizabeth gets pregnant, and she stays hidden for a few months. About the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy or so, uh, the angel Gabriel comes and visits Mary. So we've got the same messenger angel visiting Zechariah and visiting Mary. And when Mary <clears throat> hears from this angel, she's told that she will bear a son, uh, son of the Most High, and he will be given the throne of his father David. And that should take us back to the promise of 2 Samuel 7.16, that there will always be a son on the throne of David. <clears throat> and this is important for the storyline because of the fact that Luke's gospel is going to highlight the kingdom of God very significantly. So from the beginning of the gospel, Luke highlights that Jesus is going to be that king. He's going to take the rightful place of David uh, on the throne, and that then flies in the face of Caesar's kingdom. 
So there is a king that is going to be born. And what you end up kind of seeing in this book is a clash of kingdoms or a clash of cultural values. God's kingdom versus the kingdom of the world and how those differ from one another and how they contrast with one another. Now, why is it that Zechariah is punished and Mary is blessed in these stories? This, the questions sound so similar. <clears throat> in verse 18, Zechariah says, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. In Mary's question, she says, how will this be, since I am a virgin? Okay. So what is the difference between these two questions? Why is it that Zechariah is judged and Mary is blessed? Well, it is in the essence of the question. Zechariah expresses doubt in his question. How shall I know this? Versus Mary, who's just... Really, she's asking about the functionality of the situation. I'm a virgin, so how is this even going to happen? Right? So Zechariah is more doubtful because of his wife's old age, where Mary is more curious. And so that's where the, the comparison or the contrast comes in, um, is in the heart of the individual. <clears throat> now, the words of Elizabeth affirm this truth in chapter 1, verse 45, when Mary and Elizabeth meet together. Um, and in verse 45, it says, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So we get some insight from Elizabeth um, about Mary, that it, although Mary asked the question, there is faith in her heart over what Gabriel has spoken. So while it can be a little challenging, we see some illumination to that. And uh, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and um, although <clears throat> Jesus, in, in Mary's womb, is probably about a month old at the time or so, um, he, John the Baptist responds in the womb of Elizabeth um, and leaps. And from there, um, in this encounter with these two women, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth, uh, Mary sings this song, which is known as the Magnificat. Uh, and the... Uh, Magnificat is a song that has been used throughout the church's history as a worship song to the Lord, um, used at various seasons in the Christian calendar, and it is a, very similar to Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse, verses 1 through 8 in, in Samuel. And the themes are quite consistent, and if you read these songs next to each other, then you'll see the resemblances between the two of them. And in Luke's starting of this book, there's a, a number of things that we see in this, in the prayer, um, pra or sorry, in the song. Prayer is a central theme. We also see the temple as a central theme in here. Um, salvation comes up, this great reversal of the poor being raised up or the lowly being raised up, and then the high are being brought low. And ultimately, this fulfillment of prophecy. So Luke is orienting his readers from the very beginning here. <clears throat> And this is uh, the uh, first mention in this story. Um, sorry, the second mention. We have the Holy Spirit coming up. So one thing I want to point out to you guys is that as you go through the book, whether while you're charting, color coding, or whatever you're doing, marking the presence of the Holy Spirit in the book of Luke will help you as you get into the book of Acts as well. It's a part of Luke's... Um, orientation of theme around the Holy Spirit, and it starts in the book of Luke and continues on into Acts. So having some um, attention to that in the book of Luke will serve you well as you go along, and we'll highlight kind of why Luke does that in here uh, as we go along. But <clears throat> after Mary's song, Zechariah, um, it comes to the point where John the Baptist will be born. Zechariah uh, is still mute up until this point. <clears throat> Now, what is interesting about this muteness for Zechariah is that right after he had received the word of the Lord, expressed his doubt, he is made mute. Now, when you think about that, the history of Israel is almost the exact same, right? They have had no prophet who has spoken to them for 400 years, or at least uh, 350 years. These are known as the prophetic years of silence, when there wasn't really a word from God or a prophet coming. And now you have this father who is mute 
And at the birth of his son, who will be the next prophet of Israel, God opens his mouth to be able to speak this prayer of blessing over his son, which is a key prayer, and I'll read it out here in just a second. But this is symbolic of what God is doing in moving prophetically through the breaking of Zechariah's silence for then Israel to receive the word of God as well, and God's silence towards Israel being relieved, so that this prophet, John the Baptist, might prepare the way for Jesus, the Messiah, right, um, in the form of kind of a new exodus. So Zechariah, it says in verse uh, 67, was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. So, again, the mention of the Holy Spirit, the direction of the Spirit in this. Blessed be the God, uh, Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation. Okay, so we have that word there that we were talking about yesterday. For us in the, in the house of his servant David. Again, these connections with the king, uh, with David, with salvation, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, in forgiveness of their sins, because the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The language in this prayer and blessing is incredibly grand and points towards John's role in preparing for the Messiah and this new redemption. Now, when you hear this prayer and you think from the position of an Israelite of Zechariah's time, you're not thinking spiritually, right? We read this prayer and we're like, oh, it's Jesus, you know? So obvious, so clear, all the spiritual redemption for them they're thinking about physical deliverance. They're thinking about physical salvation, physical redemption. The sunrise will visit us from on high and give light to those who sit in darkness, right? It, referring to Israel, having sat in darkness, right? There hasn't been a prophet for hundreds of years. And so all of this floating around this prophecy. Now, when you think about this, this is all spoken 30 years before Jesus' ministry starts. Okay. This isn't like, we can read this and it seems like it's right on the heels. Jesus is born, he starts his ministry, and it's like super fast. 30 years earlier, Mary is, praying, is singing this song in chapter 1 with Elizabeth while she's still pregnant. Zechariah, while Mary is still pregnant with Jesus, Elizabeth gives birth to John the Baptist, and they prophesy about Jesus. And what Luke is showing us from the very beginning is all that was surrounding the, the um, period of Jesus's um, or Mary's pregnancy with Jesus, Jesus' gestation period, growing as a, as an, uh, a fetus. And the, the messages here point towards who Jesus will be. And so Luke is trying to orient us here, um, talking about new redemption, talking about the prophecy that will be fulfilled, salvation comes up three times in this one prophecy, um, with focus on deliverance from enemies and making peace. And so there is a clear connection with what they want physically, but what God is going to do spiritually, right? As he talks about the forgiveness of sins, the tender mercies of God, um, deliverance from their enemies, um, that they might serve him without fear, right? The, these, this type of language that is then used for how we're to live as Christians on the other side of the resurrection, right? So there is a clear expressed difference in what Zechariah is talking about and thinking he's talking about, but actually what the Spirit is referring to. There, there is a difference, although they seem so similar. So, when we look at it with spiritual eyes of what is going on, um, it helps us to see what Luke is trying to do, both through Mary's prophecy and through Zechariah's prophecy, and then what will happen um, as Jesus arrives at the temple. Now, Luke gives us kind of a fast-forward button at the end of each of these chapters. Chapter 1, verse 80 and the child grew up and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. That's like Luke hits the fast forward button, and he was in the wilderness until his ministry, right? So um, we're going to get the same thing in chapter 2, verse 52. 
uh, with Jesus at the end there. But as we open up chapter 2, Luke orients it um, very specifically in history with Caesar Augustus being Caesar, Caesar and Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria. And this registration that is called, asking each person to go to his own town. <clears throat> and this census most likely began in 8 BC or so. Caesar Augustus probably is taking a census, or the, he had taken a census in 8 BC, and um, censuses in the ancient world could have taken multiple years, and so it may have been sometime during this period that Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem to be counted in this census. And the birth story of Jesus is uh, a pretty standard story. There's not much to note about it. Um, he is uh, born in this, may, uh, in this stable, um, laid in a manger, and <clears throat> that is then spoken to these shepherds by the angels. So there's shepherds out in the field, and this angel appears to them, and the amazing comparisons between these people and Jesus, right, the shepherds who are then told to go and visit the good shepherd, right, who will shepherd Israel, and that these shepherds, uh, interestingly, are around the, the city of Bethlehem, and the city of Bethlehem was the location where the temple commissioned shepherds to tend to the flocks of Passover lambs. So for the whole year, the, the temple would pay shepherds to tend to flocks of sheep that would be used on Passover as the lambs for all of the nation of Israel. Because Jews, as they travel to Jerusalem, cannot bring their own sheep. You know, who knows what's going to happen? You travel from North Africa or, let's say, from um, Greece, and you bring a lamb with you on a boat, and that lamb breaks its leg along the way. Well, now you can't offer it as a sacrifice. It gets a cut on the way. Something happens to the lamb, you can't offer it as a sacrifice anymore. So what people would do is that they would sell their goods or sell their sheep where they were from or just bring money, and when they get to Jerusalem, they buy a new sheep and offer that on Passover. And so these shepherds are the ones who are tending to the Passover lambs, and the angels speak to them to go and visit the one who will be the true Passover lamb of Israel, right? the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So it is a phenomenal um, symbolism here with everything that is happening in this first chapter, or in this, uh, in this story of Jesus in the second chapter here. <clears throat> and at Jesus' dedication, so after this event, um, Jesus is then brought up to the temple where he will be dedicated <clears throat> and redeemed according to the law. And we see that Jesus' family is not well off because they buy the sacrifice that is the cheapest sacrifice that they can offer to little birds. So they are um, not well off. And in coming to the temple, <clears throat> we see two people who are going to bless Jesus, uh, Simeon and Anna. And this brings up a number of themes that Luke is threading through again. We see this taking place at the temple, the highlight of women, in fact, a marginalized woman, a widow who is old and at the temple. Um, the topic of salvation coming up here uh, from Simeon when he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Okay. <clears throat> now, how about you guys? But holding a little infant baby, maybe a newborn, um, you don't necessarily feel that way, you know? You wouldn't see a baby and be like, man, this is the salvation of our people, right? Um, this, so at the leading of the Holy Spirit, right, this prophecy that's spoken over Jesus from the beginning then helps to understand, again, what Luke is doing at the beginning, orienting our vision in all that will happen. So he helps, helps to lay a foundation work. <clears throat> and... When Jesus is a little bit older, you have this story of him sticking around in Jerusalem after a Passover. When we look at this passage, we might ask ourselves, why is it that we really don't know that much about Jesus' childhood? I mean, he's a pretty important figure. Why is it that we really only know about three years of his life, and we really don't understand much about his childhood? What's going on during those years? Well, it's probably pretty ordinary. 
there probably is not too much to say about his childhood. Uh, I, I kind of thought about it this way, is that when Luke goes to interview Mary and talks to Mary about uh, Jesus and asks, him, asks her, like, what was his childhood like? She probably said something like, yeah, you know, it was pretty ordinary. There's no, really not that much to say. He just grew up and he matured and grew in wisdom. But there was this one time when he was about 13 years old. You know, and Or I remember when he was a baby and she tells these stories about like at the beginning of his life and then the time when he got lost in the temple or got forgotten in Jerusalem. So it, paint the story. I mean, it's really easy to read the story and just kind of go through it. But the fact that they are traveling away from Jerusalem. And at right now, our time, like if you left your kid somewhere like this, it would be like chaos, right? But at this time, the way that caravans would travel is you would travel with a large group of family or very close friends, and your kids might have been riding in their cart or playing with the other kids at some different part of the caravan, and so it's not that big of a deal. Like, oh, Jesus is just back with his friends, you know? And we'll just catch up with him tomorrow morning at breakfast or whatever it might be. And they come to find that he's missing, and then they're searching all around, come back to Jerusalem, and how long are they looking for Jesus? Three days. <laughs> three days Jesus is gone, right? Astounding. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, it's three days they're looking in Jerusalem, but it's already been at least two more days because they had gone out and he was gone for one day, and then they had to come back to Jerusalem a whole nother day, and then look for three days. So it's like five days since the Passover, and Jesus has been gone. Like, five, could you imagine? Like, you know all the prophecies. You were there, right? Like, you heard those things, you heard what Simon and Anna said, and now five days, and you can't find Jesus anywhere. That's, a, that's some weight, okay? And they end up, of course, finding him in the temple. We know the story. He's uh, sitting in the temple and um, confounding everybody. They're all astonished at him. And he's like, well, why wouldn't you know I'm in my father's house? Uh, and when we read the story, we, I think it's well of us to ponder the humility of Jesus. That while he is in the temple able to confound the highest teachers of his day, he is still submitted to the leadership that God has placed him under in Mary and Joseph. And he could have easily just said, you know, I've got this. I'm just going to go ahead and live my life now, thanks. But he goes back home with them. right? And I think uh, it just demonstrates for us his attitude of humility and submission. Um, and so this question of, you know, would we respond like Jesus? Would we respond uh, like Jesus to his parents to submit to um, acknowledge the leadership that's been placed over us, and even if it, even if we may not like it at the time, that we would um, honor it in what God has given to us. And, or, you know, um, are we responding like Mary and Joseph in here, being uh, completely aware of what God said that he was doing in somebody's life and trusting, um, trusting God with their life? I think thinking about Mary and Joseph, they have an incredible responsibility and they are very much aware of that. You know, that song, Mary, Did You Know? Yes, she did. You know, yeah. <laughs> you don't got to ask the question. Obviously, she knew what she was doing, who she had, and all this kind of stuff, right? So uh, how, how do we steward what God has given to us? So there's some good questions just here to, to ponder at the very beginning of this book. And Luke sets us off um, in a unique way that nobody else does. Uh, with all of this information about Jesus' childhood, uh, what was going on with John the Baptist, and the setting, setting up the story for us to get into this book. So in chapter 3 then, we've got all of these people. And I don't put this all up here for you to write down, but just to be able to see and look at the fact that what Luke is doing here is setting his story very clearly inside of a, con a historical context. So he is wanting you to know that what he is writing is very trustworthy. <clears throat> because all of these people have to line up precisely, right? He, he can't just flippantly throw names around here and just whoever he wants and say, yeah, this guy was Caesar and this other guy was king. He has to be sure about what he is writing and recording um, to give assurance to his readers and also to help them place it inside of history. 
when there is no standard calendar in the world at the time? How do you tell somebody when something happened? Right? You have to relate it to other things that were going on, other people that were alive at the time, who was in power. Okay? And the more people that you can uh, name who were in power at the time in some capacity, the more precise you can get with the exact time of Jesus' ministry. So that's what Luke is trying to do. He can't just say, you know, on April 3rd, Jesus started his ministry. Okay? He, there was no year for him to be able to, to put down. So he lists all these people to set, this, uh, set the stage for him here. And the, uh, we get this 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. So that gives us kind of that standard. We know who else was in power. So this is about 28, so it's 29 AD or so. And if you just pay attention to the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what is interesting is that Jesus' ministry appears to only be one year. We often talk about the three years of Jesus' ministry. Where does the three years of Jesus' ministry come from? Well, it's not Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They only have one Passover in the whole book, okay? and that is the final Passover at the end of the Gospel. So the three-year ministry of Jesus comes from the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem three times for three Passovers. So it appears that each one of these Passovers is a separate Passover event, and so that's where we get the three-year ministry of Jesus from. If it is a, and, and so this is where we kind of have differ on this, is because there is a split between Jesus' ministry ending or his crucifixion and resurrection taking place in April of 30 AD or in April of 33 AD. So there is a divide over did Jesus um, die and resurrect in 30 or 33? Okay. We, and we don't know. Um, there's, there's a likelihood on either side of that, but if it is 30, it, it fits with that one-year ministry. And if it's 33, it fits with the three-year ministry from about 29 until maybe um, 33 or so. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yes. I can leave it up there for a second. How do people kind of put that together? Like, it almost is like one is counterintuitive. Like, if these say one year and this says three years, how can they both be right? I mean, obviously, we know they mm -hmm. both are telling the truth, but I mean, some people take that and be like, look yeah. at this, it means they're not telling the same story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, you can look at it two ways. Either the um, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have left out the events of the other Passovers because they were not pertinent for what the story that they are telling, right? So we know that Luke is writing for a clear purpose, and so maybe those other events, that have gone, him going up to those other two Passovers, may not have been significant for the story, and so he just doesn't include that. Because what we see with Luke is he's writing a very clear story of Jesus going to Jerusalem, right? Chapter 9, verse 51 is an important marking moment in Luke where he says, and Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. And then at the end of chapter 18 is when he turns and he is going then up to Jerusalem in chapter 19. So Luke is doing something very particular. And then in Acts, when he's then going away, uh, or in Acts when they're going away, chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus kind of gives the projection for the book of Acts. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so in the same way, that Jesus is going to Jerusalem, then the church is going out from Jerusalem. And so we get this kind of crescendo or climax with Jerusalem here. And that, um, that's what Luke is trying to do. So if he included these other Passovers, which take place in Jerusalem, let's say in the middle of his ministry, you're like, okay, well, it defeats the purpose of his design to do that, right? So that's one way of explaining why the synoptics may not have it. Now, Matthew and Mark, you may have to finagle it a little bit and discuss why they're doing what they're doing and why may they not include that. Um, the other way of finagling it down to a one-year ministry is that um, John, while he includes three Passovers, is very, um, what, not uncaring. He just is unconcerned with chronology. Um, we obviously have the chronological experience of Jesus from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry, 
But in between there, when things happen, where Jesus is, John is not as much concerned with this happened and then this and then this and then this, where Luke is very concerned with an orderly account. John is kind of just like, here's the stories. And what, and you guys know from the Old Testament, chronology is not that big of a deal to a Hebrew thinker. They might take things out of order to prove a theme or to back up a point, right? But not necessarily in a linear manner like we would want them to do. So Luke is more of the linear thinker, where John is more of the Hebraic thought, where he's going to say, I'm going to tell you a story. And all of it is true, but it may not all be in chronological order. Does that make it false? No. It just means that that's not what he's trying to do. So those are ways of uh, engaging that conversation. You guys good on this slide? Okay. So with the beginning of John's ministry, this is the first thing we have at, in chapter 3 is the opening up of John's ministry. And he is preaching repentance. Right. That's where he starts. And we saw that as a major aspect of salvation. And so in the preparation uh, for Jesus' ministry, John is preaching repentance. And <clears throat> he is preaching about a king that will come. Right. And we know from the prophecy to Mary that this will be Jesus um, having the way prepared for him and it sounds like what would happen for Caesar when Caesar would come to town they would revamp all the roads they would spruce up the cities uh, they would fill in all the potholes so that as he travels he would have a smooth ride okay so that's the same kind of thing that um, John is talking about here of course quoted from the book of Isaiah to make all the path straight and smooth so that as it says in verse 6 that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Okay. So we've had this word come up quite a bit at the beginning of this gospel, that this is the focus of what uh, Luke is trying to do, is this book is about salvation that will come from Jesus. Um, Luke 19.10, kind of the summary verse uh, of the book of Luke, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Okay. That's, that is kind of this, uh, this key point of the book of Luke. Now, one of the things you have Luke having, or um, John having all these crowds come to him, and after he has spoken to the crowds about preparing the way for Jesus, he makes this statement about the crowds, calling them a brood of vipers. Okay. Now, when you think of a brood of vipers, uh, how else could you translate that? Maybe a little bit more um, updated version. That's uh, simply saying you're the children of snakes. Okay. Now, why is that confrontational? Right? Oh, I mean, already, you, you can just think of everything that snake entails. But for these people at the time, who did they consider them children of? Who, When they said, you know, I'm a child of who? Abraham. Right? I'm a child of Abraham. <laughs> yeah, they're not children of God yet. Don't worry. Uh, that'll come later. <clears throat> Which is an important point later uh, for believers that... Uh, Side caveat, um, the only people who are children of God are those who are adopted into his family. I mean, it's not actually theologically correct to go down to the street out here and call everybody children of God. They're not children of God yet. Right? You have to be adopted into God's family to be his child, okay? according to the New Testament. They're made in the image of God, but they're not his children. Okay? Um, just a side, side note there. Uh, all right, so, so, so uh, John tells all these people, you are children of snakes, right? Instead of being children of Abraham. And this is, then they say, well, we have Abraham as our father. And John's like, well, I can tell you for sure that God can raise up children from Abraham from wherever he wants to. Even from these stones can he raise up children from Abra for Abraham. So what is, what is it about this being children, okay? Well, children are said in the time to replicate their father. Okay? So, if you're children of snakes, then who is their father? The snake. Right? The only snake really mentioned in the Old Testament as a prime figure, Genesis chapter chapter 2 and 3, right? Or chapter 3, right? The snake in the garden who is leading Adam and Eve into temptation. And so what he is saying to them right now is, you are children of the snake from the very beginning, is essentially what he's telling to them. You have got to get your lives straight and align yourself with God. Now, what is it about that snake? That snake 
is in direct disagreement with God's will, God's desires, right? And he is trying to contradict what God is doing. And so John here basically says, you need to bear fruits in accordance with repentance, i.e. turn back to the ways of God, turn away from the ways of the snakes like you are children of right now, and walk in the ways of Abraham. Otherwise, you'll be thrown into the fire, which is some pretty strong words from John the Baptist here from the very beginning. Um, and this is a, it's a big call you guys it's a you're going to see this in the book of Acts as well Philip I'm sure will highlight that this aspect of repentance um, that all gospel preaching involves repentance right receiving Jesus involves acknowledgement of walking in the wrong direction and the need of a change and John the Baptist preaches it here Jesus preaches it all throughout his ministry and then uh, as we progress then, we get this baptism of Jesus taking place by John. And Jesus is baptized here. Uh, and why is Jesus baptized? That's a big question oftentimes. Why is it that Jesus is baptized? Well, if John's baptism is a baptism of repentance, and Jesus has never sinned before and will never sin, then why does Jesus get baptized by John? A couple thoughts. <clears throat> it... It could be two, two major reasons people suggest. Identification with Israel is one of them. That Jesus is not getting baptized because he needs to get baptized. He's getting baptized as an act of intercession. He is going to live the life that Israel was called to live. And so he models that and identifies himself with the people of Israel through an act of intercession, standing in the gap, identifying with his people, and going under the water as Israel. Okay, so that's one suggestion here. The other could be that he is identifying with and affirming the ministry of John as having come from God. So the fact that uh, John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, the Messiah affirms that ministry and gives it credibility. Especially in light of the fact that um, later on people are going to be offended by John. Of course, he'll be beheaded, and they'll question you know, whether it was uh, Jesus will ask him, well, was John's ministry from God or not? And everybody held him to be a prophet, but the religious leaders didn't like what he was saying. <clears throat> John the Baptist and Jesus pretty much have the exact same ministry. Okay. Uh, not in preparing the way, but in the message that they were speaking, right? Of repentance, get ready for the kingdom to come. Right? They are very, very similar in what they have to say. Um, what about this genealogy? This, uh, this long genealogy here is included in Luke, but not in the other Gospels. Matthew includes a genealogy in his Gospel, but if you parallel these two next to each other, they are completely different. Um, they will align in certain portions, but majority of it will divert one from the other. So why is Luke doing this? Why does he include a separate one? Well, one of the suggestions has been that this might be the genealogy of Mary, and that uh, because Jesus descended from the physical body of Mary, that this is tracing Mary's genealogy. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, it starts by saying he was the supposed son of Joseph at the very beginning, as well as the fact that Luke has no problem talking about women. So to say, oh, this might be the genealogy of Mary, doesn't really hold a lot of ground, because if it was, Luke would have definitely given her credit for it knowing all that we do about Luke from the gospel. Um, the other suggestion is that uh, in various cultures around the world, I mean, you might, uh, one, for example, the Maori culture in New Zealand will trace their genealogies through different aspects of their family line for different purposes. Because the point of tracing a genealogy is not just to show who your ancestors were, but to show your credibility. So it traces, you often will trace back your genealogy to one individual to show why you have the right to do what you are doing. Okay, and that's exactly what Luke does here. When Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy, he only traces it back to Abraham okay, to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham, the blessing to all nations. When Luke traces Jesus' genealogy, he goes all the way back to God. Right, so he traces it to Adam, and then he says, Adam, who was a son of God. So he goes back to God as the father. So Luke seems to be tracing Jesus' genealogy for the purpose of pointing it back to, uh, to his father in heaven. But why does it divert so much in the middle? 
nobody has a good answer. There have been so many suggestions um, from leveret marriage and um, the uh, change of spouses or things like that, but uh, really nobody, nobody really knows. Um, it is interesting to consider the fact that if Joseph was from the line of David um, and Mary, whose cousin is Elizabeth, and uh, priests mostly marry within their own how, or within their own tribe, the Levites, the Elizabeth and Mary might have been cousins from the tribe of Levi. So Jesus could have descended from a priestly line and a kingly line is one suggestion. There's just an interesting one. But at the end of the day, nobody knows why the difference is. So let's move on and talk about the temptation of Jesus. We'll, we'll finish this slide and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break. So the temptation of Jesus is ordered differently in the book of Luke than Matthew, which I mentioned briefly yesterday. And the climactic temptation in Luke's gospel is the temple, right? Uh, to jump off from the pinnacle of the temple, which is the highest point. You remember I showed you that place where the retaining wall was still intact? Um, at the time of Jesus, uh, I mean, I'm pointing to the screen, it's not here right now, but it was like here, and then the wall was built up high. Um, that point right there is the pinnacle of the temple um, because that is the highest point that you can jump off of, okay? Or the, the tallest uh, point in the whole temple precinct, right? Nobody went on top of the temple, so it's not Jesus on top of the temple. It's him on top of this wall because jumping down off that wall, you're leaping into the Kidron Valley, which then goes below the bedrock, okay? So the um, temptation then to jump off here is the climactic one. And what Luke parallels in, in this passage is the um, temptations that had been faced in the past. We have the temptation of Adam and Eve in the garden to usurp a position of authority in the kingdom. We have the um, temptations of Israel in the wilderness to parallel what they had failed to do. And what we see is that the things that Jesus is tempted in in chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke are things that he is going to face in the coming months of his ministry when he is going to be challenged with denying kingship for himself, where he could have taken this rightful place of authority and rulership, he denies that. When we see him here being tempted about feeding himself, we're going to end up seeing him feeding multitudes of others. Um, when we see Jesus here being tempted to, take, to throw himself down and be caught up by the angels, at the end of his ministry, he's going to be taunted by saying, why don't you take yourself down from the cross? So these temptations that Jesus faces at this moment from Satan are going to be temptations that he faces from the mouths of others throughout the length of his ministry. Um, or he's going to fulfill them, i.e. feeding of the 5,000 versus feeding himself here. And what that kind of shows us is this important point that victories must be won in private so that they can be won in public. And if we fail to win the victory in our private life, then we almost certainly will fail to win that victory in the public life. And we see that. Um, we see many people who have had their ministries swept out from under them because they had failed to live godly lives in their private lives. And their ministry faltered or completely collapsed. I mean, one of the most recent ones and one of the great, greatest falls in the past five years has been Ravi Zacharias, who had a global ministry. And yet, because of his actions in private, completely destroyed his ministry and reputation. Okay, I think it's a good time for us to take a break. So let's take 10 minutes or so. Can we, can we just start right at 10... Um, 1028. Yeah, we'll start right before 1030. So maybe be back in your seats by 1028 and we'll get going then. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay.
I mean, I added up on here the other, like, earlier this year before I put up some other stuff, and it was uh, about, like, 375 hours on there, so there's a lot of teaching um, available. And then I've added another probably 70 hours of YouTube videos since then, so we're getting to start to push in 500, so. Yeah, Christer and Niji at uh, dot wordpress.com. And then at the top there's a tab for teaching. So, if you're looking for more, um, if you don't enjoy the teaching this week, then don't utilize the resource. So, um, but anyways. Okay, <clears throat> so as we uh, look at the ministry of Jesus beginning here, one thing that we want to pay attention to in these first uh, four chapters is seeing the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been the one leading throughout these chapters. We saw already with Mary and then with Zechariah and with John the Baptist and with Jesus here as he is led into the wilderness. And so we see a number of things. We see the Spirit descending upon Jesus, the beginning of his ministry. We see the Spirit leading him into the wilderness. We see the Spirit filling Jesus with power and then appointing him for ministry. <clears throat> now, when we focus on the working of the Holy Spirit and his presence in this book, one thing that we would notice if you highlight all the usages <coughs> is that the... Are you okay there? Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the usage of the Holy... The, the title Holy Spirit or mention of his name in this book appears 11 times in about the first three and a half chapters of this book. But then over the next about 20 chapters, only six times. So the, the frequency of mentioning of the Holy Spirit is quite significant because the percentage based on usage versus chapters is about the same percentage as it is in the book of Acts. Okay. Um, in the book of Acts, we're going to see, see you know, we're not taking too much away here, trying to connect these books without stealing too much of Philip's thunder, um, but uh, <clears throat> is mentioned about 57 times. So this frequency of usage across the 28 chapters of Acts parallels the usage of it here at the beginning, prior to, or at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So what Luke is trying to highlight is this. The Holy Spirit has been at work prior to Jesus' birth, at the beginning of his ministry, and then continues on even after he is gone. But what is happening with these chapters? Why is the Holy Spirit mentioned so infrequently? And in, these, in the mention of the Holy Spirit in these chapters, it's not like what the Holy Spirit is doing, but it's kind of what Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. So where is the Holy Spirit. Why isn't he being mentioned? Well, we've got to read between the lines because it's not like he stopped working in those chapters, but it's that we see Jesus' anointing and the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work in his life through what he is doing. And so what we are supposed to see then is Jesus being led by the Spirit of God, being guided by the Holy Spirit, and being completely reliant and dependent upon the, the Holy Spirit in his life. And it then provokes the question of us is, are, are we reliant upon the Holy Spirit? And do we give the recognition to the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day lives, even though it might not seem like he's moving, right? It might not seem like he's present, but do we give credit where credit is due in the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Because we clearly, I mean, none of us would doubt that the Holy Spirit is moving in Jesus' life even though he's not mentioned. Okay, so, just as a curiosity to be aware of. Jesus' ministry begins then in chapter 4. This is where we start to take the shift uh, away from the introduction. And <clears throat> that happens in 4.14. Right? Jesus returned in power of the, of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So this is kind of his Galilean ministry, and this is going to go from about chapter 4 all the way up till chapter 9, where then we're going to shift and move towards Jerusalem. So at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus preaches in a synagogue, he opens up to Isaiah, 
and reads about this passage, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And when Jesus reads this passage from Isaiah, this passage is about God's ministry to the marginalized. Right? It highlights proclaiming good news to the poor, uh, proclaiming liberty to the captives, sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed. Right? This is not a message to the high class, rich rulers in society. This is a message of hope and deliverance to the people at the bottom. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. This is his ministry and what, what he is doing. Now, there's a, a couple things to highlight in here <clears throat> about Jesus' ministry. He, he sits down to teach the people, and they're amazed at him. But that amazement quickly turns to skepticism. And what Jesus says is that surely you will proclaim to me or quote to me the proverb, physician, heal yourself. Why don't you just take care of yourself as well? And this will be essentially the same thing that Jesus is told on the cross in chapter 23, verse 35. Save yourself. So he is, again, he's tempted with the same kind of thing at the beginning of his ministry. Why don't you just heal yourself? Why don't you just save yourself? Right? <clears throat> and so you look at the beginning and the end of his uh, earthly ministry. It's like this inclusio or the figure of speech, merism, like we mentioned yesterday. But Jesus mentions... Um, Elijah and Elisha, which is unique to Luke as well. So why is it that Jesus mentions Elijah and Elisha here? Well, in light of what he just quoted from Isaiah 61 about the ministry to the low in society, the marginalized, Elijah and Elisha's ministry took them to outsiders, people who were outside of Israel, people who were not of the children of Israel. They were Gentiles. And that is incredibly provoking to the crowds to the point where they wanted to take Jesus away and throw him off a cliff. Pretty astounding stuff, right? They want to take Jesus away and throw him off a cliff. Why? Well, he says, you know, Elijah and Elisha were sent to Israel, but nobody listened. And when nobody listened, God sent them to those who would listen. And that immediately, it begs the question, are you listening to Jesus? And they're so offended because, of, uh, because they're being grouped into this camp of those who are not listening to the messengers of God, the prophets of God. And that also provokes the question, were you listening to John the Baptist? Are you going to listen to Jesus? When he stands up and he proclaims this statement from Isaiah, are you going to listen to him? From, from there, um, he skirts out of this group who knows whether he just went invisible or whether he ducked out of the crowd somehow we don't know what happened but he gets out of the way um, he safely gets away to Capernaum and which is a city of Galilee and there is a, a man with an unclean spirit <clears throat> now the unclean spirits this uh, this phrase um, in verse 33 a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon when he cried out with a loud voice, he said, Ha! What have you to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Isn't that a, shouldn't that be a little odd to us? What is odd about that? If you were, an, if you were the enemy of Jesus, wouldn't you want to hide his identity from people? Wouldn't you want to distort his identity if you were his enemy, right? If you, if you were a demon, a servant of Satan, wouldn't you want to distort the identity of Jesus so people do not know who he is? But instead what you find out is the demons, the, the quote, enemies of God, are proclaiming the true identity of Jesus. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, when we think about, like, demonology or this the spiritual world, um, it's important to know kind of how the Greek world and how the first century world thought of demons and this word um, demonion and the uh, verb uh, uh, demonizo, which it means to be oppressed by a demon um, or is oppressed by a spirit. And that is that the, the general thought on the spiritual world, on demons, on unclean spirits was not that they were directly always the servants of Satan, but that they are kind of like wild spirits. Right? If you think of like a wild animal, when you go out and maybe you're hiking in the forest and you see a cougar, 
on the path, or a mountain lion, or a bear, what do you do? You run away, right? <laughs> you go in the opposite direction. You get a, as far away from that animal as possible. Why? Because they're unpredictable. You don't know what that animal is going to do. Is it in a good mood? Is it in a bad mood? Is, does it have cubs nearby? Is it going to protect its kin? You don't know what that wild animal is going to do. And so you flee. You run away from that wild animal. And that kind of thought was the thought that a lot of the, the world at the time, including Jews, had considered about demons, is that these spirits are like wild animal spirits. It's not that every spirit is a servant of Satan. Some of the spirits out there that are possessing people are just spirits, and they are like wild animal spirits. They're untamed. They're unpredictable. You don't know what they're going to do next. And so this, this thought of then that these demons, which we then have developed into this whole um, concept of the servants of Satan, and just like every demon is the servant of Satan, that word demon, uh, demonion just means untamed spirits. Uh, is kind of a direct translation of it. So that's that, that thought there. Um, and that's suggested why then the enemies of Jesus are proclaiming his true identity. You find this also with the servants of um, Jesus in Acts 16. Paul and Silas are in Philippi, and you have this girl who's proclaiming, these are the servants of the Most High God. You're like, okay, why do you have an enemy of Jesus Christ proclaiming, listen to these people. Okay. It's not because that demon is the enemy necessarily. It's because it is a spirit recognizing the truth. Mm -hmm. right. um, so that's, that's one uh, kind of explanation there to take into consideration given the historical context. Um, <clears throat> the, let's see here. Jesus in his casting out of demons, one of the things to be aware of is that there was uh, a very profitable ministry of um, exorcism at the time of Jesus amongst the Jews. Pharisees uh, went around practicing exorcisms, uh, had very specific laid out rule books and procedures of how they would do that, and this would involve um, certain rituals, um, identification of the name of the spirit, and then driving them out by the power of Yahweh. So it's very clear, very ritualized and specific. Um, again, if you've watched The Chosen, the scene with Mary Magdalene and the religious leaders is that kind of thing. Very ritualized, very specific, bringing with incense and all that kind of stuff. What shocks people is not that Jesus can cast out demons, because everybody knew about that, that process. And everybody was aware of exorcism at the time. What shocks people is that Jesus just says it and they're gone. Right? They're amazed at the type of authority he possesses. Right? That's what sets him apart from everybody else. Is Not that demons are leaving, but that he can do it at a simple word and has the authority to do it. Right? Um, in verse 38, uh, sorry, 36, it says, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. They're amazed at this simple authority. <clears throat> the, the calling of disciples story... Uh, down beyond here. The point to pay attention to in Luke's gospel is something, again, that he highlights with the calling of the disciples, and that is that um, we know that Jesus had been to Peter's house before. Okay? Um, he had been with Peter. He had been to his house. He had, um, Peter had seen him minister, so it's not like um, Simon is brand new, uh, has, does, has no idea who Jesus is, has never met him in his life. But when Jesus calls Peter... Peter leaves everything. Okay. And that is this unique aspect of Luke's gospel. Both here and with the calling of Levi, or Matthew, is that they immediately left everything and followed Jesus. Right? Leaving, uh, taking nothing with them, just going forward to follow Jesus. And that is a, it will be an important aspect to the kingdom of God and lordship in the gospel of Luke, is that discipleship in the kingdom of God is truly calling Jesus Lord. And that phrase that we know rings true that if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And that's what is exemplified here, is counting the cost. We're going to see this in chapter 14 with discipleship. Counting the cost of following Jesus, laying down everything to follow him. Now, not letting 
uh, anything hold them back, that they are not uh, unwilling to forsake something. Right? That is all aspects of discipleship in the kingdom of God, according to Luke's gospel. Right? It, is a, it is a costly thing to follow Jesus. And as uh, Jesus will say in chapter 14, <clears throat> he does not give anybody a hard time for counting that cost. Right? For considering it, thinking about it. He says, you should not just go off willy-nilly. Don't just make an impulsive decision to follow me. You have to count the cost. You have to know what you're getting yourself into. And, and when Jesus, when people leave Jesus, you know, think of the people, the feeding of the 5,000, then there's a huge crowd. Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all these people are like, whoa. No thanks. Right? And they all leave Jesus. Jesus isn't like a minister today where he's like, wait, 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 please come back. Like, I'll explain myself. Let me just clear things up so you know what I'm talking about here. He just says, he turns to his disciples and says, do you guys want to go also? Right? Jesus is so secure in himself. He doesn't need people to validate him or testify to his legitimacy. He is confident and sure in who he is. And if people are unwilling to follow him, he doesn't beg them. He invites them, but he's not a beggar. Right? And so, he tells people, you've got to count the cost. You've got to know what you're getting yourself into. Because it is a foolish thing for somebody to start on a project in which they have not counted the cost, and then they have to stop halfway through because it gets too hard or too costly for them. Jesus said it's better if they just never even started. Some strong words. Right? We go around just telling everybody, just come, follow. It's fun. It's great. It's awesome. Jesus says, you got to count the cost first. got to know what you're getting yourself into. Right? And when people left him, he said, you know, I understand. I get it. Right, same thing. You'll see the same thing in Acts, the rest of the New Testament. <clears throat> and so we'll highlight this as we get up uh, along in the gospel. But for now, let's keep going. Um, after the calling of uh, G after the calling of Peter, here we have this healing of a leper, um, and this is in between the calling of Peter and Levi. And in this healing of a, of the leper, I want to highlight this because it happens a number of times in the Gospels, and so it's important to talk about because this kind of prof this kind of healing I think is profound in all of the Gospels. Why? Why is this? healing so important <clears throat> it's because of verse 13 in verse 13 the Luke tells us or uses two important verbs it says that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him why is that so significant because Jesus doesn't even have to be in eyesight of the person he's healing. Think of the centurion's servant, right? Who, he's like, my servant is dying. Please come and heal him. And then, while Jesus is on the way, he sends servants say, no, you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word. And Jesus is like, wow. Well, your servant's going to be healed. He's not even close to him. And he heals him. Jesus doesn't have to touch people. He doesn't even have to see people to heal them. Right? So, why does Jesus go out of his way to touch this man to heal him? Because this healing is not just about his physical health. It's about his social restoration. Who knows how long this man had gone without being touched by anybody? Because whoever touched him would become unclean. Now, as you know, uncleanliness is not a sin, right? Right? But it does restrict you from doing certain things. It, it, it's in, uh, inhibitive, right? It holds you back from um, certain uh, practices or places or crowds of people. And so you think of this man. He has had leprosy. He says he was full of leprosy. His whole body is covered. Who knows how long he has been socially ostracized for? He comes to Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, well, just wait over there and I'll just pray for you from here. He touches him. He reaches out. And this is not just a healing for him. This is a healing for his community as well. Because now they see what Jesus has done. 
they see him touching him, and they will be more receptive to him as an individual. And so this is much bigger than physical healing. Jesus is much more concerned with the healing of a person than he is just with the healing of their body. And sometimes that can be all we are concerned with. And I think it's important to ask ourselves, you know, are we concerned with the the healing of the whole person or just the healing of their physical body? And as well, this shows the temple activity, right? That Jesus is um, acting as the temple and healing people. Uh, Miracles are being performed in his presence. The the next one, just to point out here, I'm, I'm going kind of slow through these chapters because I'm building up, hitting a lot of things that will then kind of replay themselves throughout the gospel. So it may seem like we're going a little slow here in light of the time that we have, but we will pick up speed as we go along and as we've talked about things or covered things already. So um, in Jesus' ministry then, chapter 5, we have this, uh, this moment of a man being healed. And the question on people's minds is, is this man paralyzed because of his sin or somebody else's, right? Or it, it must be because of his own sin. Sorry, I'm thinking of John chapter 9, where John chapter 9, the disciples are asking the same question. You know, is it this man who sinned or his parents who sinned that he was born blind? Right? And so there is this strong connection between infirmity, sickness, and sin in the minds of the first century Jews. And that's not for, uh, that's not for nothing. You know, there's plenty of times in the Old Testament where someone had done something wrong and then had suffered physically for it. Right? You think of the king going into the temple to offer and burn incense, and he comes out with a skin disease on his forehead, right, having been struck by God. So there is these moments where somebody does disobey God, and it does result in physical infirmity. In fact, in John chapter 4, um, or John chapter 5, when Jesus goes to the, to the pool of Bethesda and heals a man, right, uh, that man takes up his mat and walks away. And Later on, he finds Jesus, and and Jesus tells the man, go and sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Implicationally, what had happened was because he had sinned in some way. And so, it's not that sickness and infirmity never comes from sin, but that's not the only reason that it comes. And so that's what Jesus is trying to disconnect in their minds here, and correct in their perspective. But I think that we have to also be aware of the fact, because we've gotten so much to the point where we say, oh, that is not because of sin, it it might be because of an attack of the enemy, it might just be bad health, or all these type of things, that we've got to also balance that by saying, you've got to examine your heart, you've got to see what's going on in there, because there, I mean, we have, I'm sure we've all heard of those stories, someone on their, you know, their deathbed, or they're dying, and it's because they have released, not released forgiveness to somebody, they forgive somebody, and suddenly they're, they're healed of cancer, you know, like, people, uh, have had all sorts of experiences in the in forgiveness, releasing of sin, repentance that have resulted in the healing of their physical bodies. And so we don't want to just discount one or the other, but have a, a full view, a holistic view of this. <clears throat> now, um, Jesus will end up offering uh, forgiveness for this person after he has been healed, which is disconnecting the man's sin from his infirmity. Okay, so they had thought he was paralyzed because of his sin. Jesus heals his paralysis and then says, your sins are forgiven. So he disconnects those ideas by showing the separation of those events for the Pharisees. Why is it so significant that Jesus offers forgiveness to this man in light of Luke's themes? Why might it be significant? Let me get you thinking here a little bit. Who can forgive sins? Jesus, yep. But in uh, before this time, who is the only one who could forgive sins? And in the mind of the Pharisees and all the Jews, who's God, the God? Yes. Right. It is only the God, only God who can forgive sins. And the priests in uh, ministry of God, as His representatives, right? They're the ones who are working on behalf of God. Where does that take place? At the temple, right? Only at the temple is somebody granted forgiveness of their sins through the sacrifices that they offer at the temple. So in Jesus is offering forgiveness to people, he is demonstrating the presence of God in their midst. Right? So simply by saying, your sins are forgiven, and them saying, only God can do that, Jesus is demonstrating the presence of God in their midst. 
Now, uh, this question about fasting and this passage that can come up uh, it seems a little odd. Uh, this, this passage where it says um, in verse 38 and 39, but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins and no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good. Well, how, what's going on here? Because I thought Jesus is bringing a new wine and new wineskin. And so why would somebody taste the new wineskin and then, or taste the new wine and want to go back to the old wine. Why is that? Well, it's probably that Jesus is talking about the Pharisees here. That as they are hearing the ministry of John, as they're hearing about the kingdom of God as having been spoken by Jesus, they would actually rather go back to the old ministry. They'd rather go back to the, the tried and the true, the, the um, familiar, the comfortable, rather than taking something new like Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God. It's easier to stick with what is familiar than it is to shake things up a little bit. And so that's probably what Jesus is talking about um, in the passage about fasting and this um, difficult passage about old and new wine. I'm going to jump over some uh, stories here to talk about the Sermon on the Plain. Because Jesus will give a similar sermon in the book of Matthew. And the Gospel of Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount. And both sermons will house very similar topics and concerns, uh, but Luke will um, differ in certain places. He'll kind of condense things a little bit and focus on some different areas. <clears throat> now, with the Sermon on the Plain, Matthew or Luke is going to focus on the beginning, these blessing and woes, where Matthew opens up with the Beatitudes, the blessings, Luke will mention four blessings and then four, four woes. And what you should notice about the blessings is that they are counterintuitive to the culture of the day. Blessed are you who are poor. No, you're not. <laughs> For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry. How about you guys? I get awful hangry when I'm hungry. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you. <laughs> right? That, that does not sound like a blessing. Right? Blessed are you when people hate you. Okay. That, these uh, blessings are counterintuitive to the culture of the, of the day. And are counterintuitive to the culture of our world today as well. Right? When you think of the, these things that are blessed, the word... Makarios, the word used for blessed, also can be translated as happy. Happy are you who are poor. Happy are you when you're hungry. Happy are you when people hate you. Okay. Doesn't sound like things that make you happy. This is part of shifting the perspective on the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the world for Jesus and his listeners. That it is upside down that it, it goes against the culture of the day. And we have to learn to accept that and learn to reconcile those differences. Um, the woes on the other side of this are woes against the things that are elevated and honored by the world. Woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who laugh. And woe to you when all people speak well of you. So, I mean, Jesus in here, he's basically saying, if you don't have any haters, then you got something wrong going on. Right. Um, this is, it's incredibly confronting for the, for the world uh, because the kingdom of God is unlike the world in any respect. It is opposite. It's upside down. And so, <clears throat> when people think we're weird for the way we live, that's normal. It's natural. It's natural to be different in the kingdom of God from the ways of the world. And if any one of us are uncomfortable being different or uncomfortable when people don't like us or don't think the way we live is acceptable, right? that is to be expected. Jesus says you should find comfort in that because they hated me first. Be concerned. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. Right? For so many Christians, there is this desire to fit in. 
right? To be accepted, to be liked, you know? And we go out and we say, why is everybody ha always hating on Christians? Why, doesn't everybody, why is this all this stuff against Christians and everybody's denouncing or, you know, it's always because of Christian, blah, blah, blah. That has been going on for 2,000 years. You go back to the early church's writings, the first three centuries, it's the same thing. Everything gets blamed on the Christians. This is nothing new. This is who we have been for 2,000 years. Even when Christianity became the legalized religion of the Roman Empire, the people who were living radically pure according to what Jesus said in the Gospels and not living a worldly life with a Christian label, they were still getting persecuted. Right? They were still getting socially ostracized. And so the kind of desire that we might have or the offense in our heart that we might cultivate because of how the world treats Christians is misplaced. Jesus never said the world will love you. He never said you'll be liked. He never said you will be the dominating religious force on the planet. What he says is that people won't like you very much. People will hate you. And you've got to count that cost. We can sometimes gloss the words of Jesus a little bit to make them easy and acceptable and nice and kind of treat him like he's a big, loving teddy bear. You don't get the reputation of being like Jeremiah and Elijah by being a loving teddy bear to everybody. Right? Jesus is he's a strong guy with some strong things to say. And we have to take it seriously. Um, and I think it, it's some quite intense calls here. Uh, Jesus will progress, and I'll, I'll hit a couple of things in this passage. Um, some things will come up, and I'll, I'll hit them at a later time. But this aspect of generosity in the kingdom of God, um, <clears throat> that there is an expectation that those in the kingdom will reflect their Father in heaven. And when their Father sent his Son to redeem their lives, to give his, his only Son, to spend himself for humanity, there is a call to live in reflection of that, to be generous with our lives, our goods, our time, and in this passage, without expecting anything back. That's true generosity. True, true generosity is giving with no expectation of repayment. Why? Because we know that God sees our giving. He sees what is given in secret, and he will reward those who give. <clears throat> and so he says, give don't ask for things in return, right? Trust our Father in heaven. And Jesus, Jesus promises that God will give unto them. The, the last one here I want to highlight is this, this uh, passage that comes basically from Matthew 7, 1 that has now become the most famous or well-known verse in the world. You go back 30 years, and the most well-known verse globally is John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, so that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's a King James Version. Uh, but lately, uh, across surveys, Matthew 7.1 is the most well-known Bible verse amongst the world. Does anybody know what it says? Judge not, lest you be judged. That's the most well-known verse by the world today, outside of Christianity. Judge not, lest you be judged. Right? And it's, people use it to abuse their own moral system. To say, you know, who are you to judge me for how I live? Okay? And so this, this passage, is, the one that's connected with this passage in Matthew and also in, in Luke, in, this, in uh, this Sermon on the Mount or Sermon on the Plain, is that when you see a speck in your brother's eye, be sure to take the plank out of your own eye. Okay. that we can't just see the speck in our brother's eye. we also got to be aware of what's in our own eye. What ends up happening then is that we look at this passage, and most people will teach this passage, you have to deal with the stuff in your own life. That's not where Jesus leaves it. Jesus says, you have to be aware of your own shortcomings as well as helping your brothers and sisters deal with theirs. Jesus doesn't say, don't help them get the speck out of their own eye. Just leave that speck in their eye. He says, be aware of what you've got in your eye before you help somebody else. Right? So he still does say, you've got to help one another. You need to help them get that speck out of their eye. 
but you've also got to recognize the fact that you've got stuff in your own life to deal with. Okay, so the um, that judging passage it's just important for us to be aware uh, that as we um, see and help one another, that we also are aware of what's in our own eyes as well. Um, <clears throat> Let's not be too quick to um, ignore what is in our own life. Oftentimes we can treat it this way, that somebody else's sin is always worse than ours. Okay. You know, some, other people are always worse sinners than we are. It's always the way it goes. You know. um, this is, uh, you know, it, I, I don't have to say any more than that, but we tend to think that way. So just as a consideration for us here. Yes. Sure. How, like, if the Lord has revealed things to you, if you're aware of the log in your own eye, like, applicable today, like, how do you approach the people that you love in your life and, like, address things and, like, bring in biblical, like, like, I'm telling you these things because God's word is, like, is, is telling me to share the truth. How do you do that? Because like it's one thing to hear you say it, and it's great, and that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. But how do you even approach that? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, what I would say is that you would do that with Christians, well, right? Okay, yes, so, yes. so it starts with that. It starts okay. with addressing Christians because those are the ones, those are the people that Jesus is calling us to address. Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians that we are called to judge the church. Right? The church is called to assess itself, to judge itself. And so that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're supposed to be able to have the capability and the wisdom to judge and assess one another as believers. Okay? So <clears throat> that being said, in bringing something to somebody, we want to do it in a way that demonstrates our love for them as much as possible, but doesn't compromise the truth. Right? And it shouldn't just be a one-off like nitpicking, you know, yeah, like, hey, I saw you do this, and they're just like, man, I was in a bad mood that day, and I wasn't acting very sanctified, yeah. you know. Um, but when we see something continually in somebody's life that is, obs like, for example, in this in this scenario that's obscuring their vision, you know, um, continually, then addressing that in a, a loving and honoring way as much as possible is what we want to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why we're having an issue right now. We'll turn off and turn back on. Sometimes it's just the cord. My Wi-Fi is not working either. It, oh, it kind of went back down. Now it started working for me again. Oh. Oh, is the Wi-Fi? Let me turn it. Let me turn it. Turn my Wi-Fi off and back on here. Anyways, the the next uh, story I wanted to hit on real quick was the again the centurion servant because the the story of the centurion in chapter seven that first story there um, connects with what Jesus has just talked about in the sermon on the plain and it's this idea that Jesus heals this this man's servant uh, and is amazed at his faith and this guy is a Gentile you know the centurion is a Gentile. And not just a Gentile, but a Gentile invader, right? He is part of the oppressive system. And, I mean, could you imagine that? <clears throat> I mean, let's take this back into uh, 18th and 19th century America, just for a second here. And you imagine an evangelist coming to um, a plantation. I'm going to use this kind of analogy here. Working among, And he's preaching the gospel to slaves, which... Um, the Methodists were doing. I'm reading about black church history right now. And the, there were Methodist ministers who came and preached to slaves. And could you imagine them preaching to slaves and the master of the plantation comes out and says, my boy's inside and he's dying, um, but you don't have to come in. Just pray for him right here and I believe that he'll be healed. And, he, and the minister is like, look at this man's faith. Look at this guy's faith. And everybody on the, all the slaves on the plantation are like, are you kidding me right now? Like, do you know what this guy does to us? And you're proclaiming him to be a man of faith? Mm -hmm. To take it into our present day context or something we can be familiar with. Jesus isn't just saying, this guy's got faith. It's like, this guy is the enemy. 
right? He is the oppressor. He is the one we all hate. And you're saying he's the one with faith? Are you even a Jew? Do you even care about us? This is exactly what Jesus says when he says, love your enemies. Right? This is the exact example of what he has said in chapter 6, verse 27. I say to you who hear, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. That is incredible. And it's more, even more incredible when you take it into the very next chapter and Jesus is doing exactly that to the people who would have openly crucified him. Nailing him to a tree and he says, love those guys. And then he's amazed at his faith. <laughs> It's crazy, right? This story is nuts. When you when you take it seriously, right, and, and look at look at what is going on here. Because the Romans, they're invaders, they're the enemies, they're the ones taxing the people. They do not love the people of Israel. And so what do we do? Do we love the people who oppress us? Do we only love the people who oppress us religiously? Because we're Christians and that's what we should do and we're persecuted. What about when we're oppressed politically? What about when we're press, oppressed economically or socially? Do we only love people when it's something that is a religious response? Jesus, the oppressed, sets the example of loving the oppressor, which is insane to me. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> Because it totally goes against the cultural standard. I mean, the Jews hated the Romans. There was only a very small contingent of Jews that would have liked the Romans. And now Jesus is saying, love these guys. <clears throat> From that story, you get the raising of the widow's son at Nain. This is a, another story that's only in the Gospel of Luke. And <clears throat> this, is a, this is an interesting story because of the fact that it, it seems... So she is a widow... We know that she has no husband, and this is her only son. And this boy has been dead a couple of days because they're in the funeral procession, right? He's in a coffin. He's going to the graveyard. So it's not like he's still warm, okay? Jesus rolls up seeing the funeral procession and basically tells him to stop, puts his hand on the, the buyer, and calls the boy to life while he's still in the coffin. The boy sits up and starts talking with Jesus. It is, I mean, could you imagine this? How offended would everybody be seeing this man stopping the procession? Like, it's like a hearse driving down the road, and a man steps out into the road and says, hold up a second, opens the back door of the hearse, rolls out the coffin, opens the lid, and everybody's like, what are you doing right now? completely offended at Jesus, right? This is unacceptable. Jesus' actions are completely breaking cultural mores. Calls the boy to life, right? This is not just another healing, right? It's not just raising the boy from the dead. This is the restoration of this widow's livelihood. She has, her only son has died. She has no husband. She is now basically sentenced to poverty the rest of her life. And when Jesus raises this boy from the dead, he is restoring her social status. He doesn't just care about the physical healing. He cares about the people. And that, I think for us, as we look at Jesus, the question that should ring in our hearts is, do we care for the people? What we're looking at in this gospel is that Jesus is not just about healing sickness. He is about the restoration of people, the healing of people. Right? And I think that's what we've got to be focused on as well. Because Jesus didn't heal everybody. Common misnomer. Jesus did not heal everybody everywhere he went. In fact, there's times we he, he went places, and there is a huge crowd of people, and he heals one person. How would you? How would all those other people feel? Right? Or you? I, I just taught Acts a couple weeks ago, so all my examples are like from the book of Acts. But uh, so I'm not going to say that example. But you think of in the in in these books, you're going to look at the think about the situations when people get healed in the book of Acts that could have been healed by Jesus, and he didn't. But then they get healed like a month later. Someone in the temple. So the uh, 
the stories of Jesus healing people are not, again, not just for the physical restoration of the body. That's so much what we're concerned with, right? When we are going through some physical pain and physical ailment, we're just concerned with the health of our physical body. When we see Jesus heal people, it's not just to make them have an easier day. Right? In fact, most of the time, Jesus isn't just healing people to relieve them of their pain. Most of the healings that happen are for the purpose of restoration. They're for the purpose of correcting perspectives. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot more going on, a lot more dimensions than just that, uh, that simple. The other one um, about this story is that it parallels Elijah and Elisha. So if you remember, Jesus' ministry started talking about Elijah and Elisha. And now... He's also connecting with their story as well. Elijah and Elisha both raised a boy from the dead for their mother. So he is paralleled here with those prophets. Um, we go until 12.15 or just 12? 12.30. Oh, 12.30. Okay, great. So we'll take a break um, in about 10 minutes. Um, actually... I want to get this up here so I can put some things on the, on there. So let's take 10 minutes and we'll start at 11.30. Sound good? And then we'll go until 12.30. Can we do the HDMI? Yes. join me in just prayer for a moment. I had gotten a text over break that one of my students, uh, who I knew had gone to the ER last night has, and had, was still there this morning, um, has heard from a surgeon he has like a hernia in a, his upper intestine. He's not able to keep any liquids down right now. So there, it's like an emergency surgery because he can't actually drink anything. So um, we just pray. You can, I'm going to pray. You guys can join me in prayer. Pray for a second and then we'll get rolling. So Lord, we just pray for uh, your protection over Wyatt, God, as he is uh, in the ER, Lord, that you give wisdom to the doctors, Jesus, and what to do in the situation, God. We just ask for restoration in his intestines, Lord, that, uh, that yeah, that hernia would heal itself, God, uh, and uh, be completely restored, God, that you would protect him in this moment, uh, give him peace, and uh, over his family as well that's at home, hearing about the situation, Lord, I pray that you would uh, watch over him and them. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this uh, picture, I think, is quite funny, Jesus, because of this because of this guy. You know? Like, <laughs> he's so skeptical. He's like, well, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> so, anyways. <laughs> That's all I got for you. Um, the... The stories in chapter 8 that are quite familiar in each one of the synoptic gospels of this woman with the issue of blood uh, for 12 years and then this, uh, and Jairus' daughter is a, uh, an amazing story. I mean, there's many parallels you can pick up on the fact that this woman has had an issue of blood for 12 years and this child, the uh, little girl is 12 years old with the book of Luke. You also see some aspects of um, this only child theme coming up, the widow, uh, the widow at Nain, whose son is resurrected, that was her only son. Uh, you see as well, uh, this daughter, Jairus' daughter, is his only child. So that kind of comes up a couple times in this gospel, so that's something just to pay attention to um, and interpret as you will. <clears throat> but the... Um, the issue, the woman with the issue of blood uh, in this story is pretty straightforward, but there's some interesting parallels that go on here as the woman reaches out and touches Jesus. She is healed instantly. She recognizes in her body she's healed instantly. And at the same moment that Jesus is telling her um, that to, uh, to go in peace, basically, he says to her, behind in my Bible here. Um, in verse 48, he says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And it says that 
In verse 49, while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. And so it is, it's just an interesting parallel. It, you can't really get this in written text the same way you can in a movie, you know, like where you hear at the same time, it would be like Jesus saying, daughter, go in peace. And at the same moment, Jairus is hearing somebody say, your daughter is dead, mm-hmm. right? So kind of the, the parallel situation there. And how would you feel if you're Jairus? Like, you're the one who came to Jesus. You're the one who is getting him to come to your house. And he's stopping and talking to this woman who's a social outcast. And who knows, Jairus might have rejected her in the past. She seems to be local to this community. And now, Jesus is giving her the time of day. And in the meantime, Jairus' daughter dies. And the important um, thing to think about with the story is, are we as happy for God to move in another person's life as we are when he moves in ours? You know, and when God moves in someone else's life, even if he's not moving in ours, do we rejoice with them as well? And it's just a, a pretty confronting concept here to consider. Um, <clears throat> Jesus, of course, ends up going to Jairus' house. Um, the daughter is raised back to life. And the elements of these stories uh, in the first part of Luke are seen uh, presenting Jesus as the temple in that where there would be pollution making him unclean. Things like leprosy, uh, blood, death. Jesus is bringing cleansing and healing to those places. So that uh, he is acting as the temple bringing restoration. Now, getting into chapter 9, we're going to start to make a transition in Jesus' ministry. In 951, there will be a very specific statement. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So that is this this direction change for Jesus. So um, as we're wrapping up this chapter in this first portion of the book, chapters 1 through 9, there's some things to reflect on. The kingdom of God in chapters 1 through 8 is mentioned three times. Chapters 9 through 19, it is mentioned 26 times. And then, chapters 20 through 24, it's mentioned five times. So what's going on here? From chapter 9 through 19, this is the portion of Luke's gospel where Jesus is setting his face towards Jerusalem and he's heading in the direction of his destiny or the the plan of God for his life. So just to keep that in mind and consider that, Luke is clearly wanting to draw the reader's focus to the topic of the kingdom of God as Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem in these travel narratives. Jesus is going to um, face all sorts of various circumstances and people as he is set on his mission towards Jerusalem, um, and that is his primary concern. So when he's thinking about Jerusalem, the place where the kings of Judah had reigned, the place where the temple is, and he's talking about the kingdom of God, that's where everybody expected it to start, was in Jerusalem. Um, Have you guys talked about the age of tension yet? See what I want to use. So, The age of tension. This is an important concept to be aware of as we think about the kingdom of God and think about what Jesus is doing. So, for the Jews, time is linear. Or maybe we'll put it like this. Um, It's kind of an image of like, at the beginning, God, there was like a red carpet, and that is time, and God like kicked the red carpet, and it's been unrolling for all of history. So for the Jews, time is linear, and it's unfolding. And so when something happens here, it affects all future events. Okay. So for example, let's make this the Ten Commandments, or the law. Okay. The law affected all of time henceforth. Okay. And it would continue to affect until the covenant is fulfilled. So there, they, the Jews didn't believe the covenant would pass away. But they did believe that there would be a moment in time that the kingdom of God would come inaugurated by the Messiah. 
and that that would happen at a specific point in history, and at that point, the kingdom of God would be established, uh, Israel would be restored, there would be a resurrection from the dead, and then that kingdom would progress for all future time. Okay. That was part of this whole belief for the Jews. So, this is referred to as this age and the age to come. Okay. So this age and the age to come. Please ignore my caps. Uh, I am not a great writer. Um, so this is, the, this is the standard Jewish view, and especially of the Pharisees, and of whom Paul was one. Paul, in coming to Christ, begins to shift what he believes about the age, uh, the age to come. Okay, now what inaugurated? What was a marking sign of the age to come? The Messiah and resurrection from the dead. Okay, those are some marking signs. So, when we think about this again, Paul kind of reworks this a little bit, and what he will say is that we still are, we still have this age. But at the death and resurrection of Christ, the age to come has begun. And what began the age to come? Resurrection. Right? Resurrection was one of the key events to the inauguration of the age to come. But it has not fully arrived yet because the final resurrection has not happened yet. When that final resurrection does happen, this age will cease and it will only be the age to come. But there, for this time, there is an overlap. There's an overlap of time periods of this age and the age to come uh, crossing over or intersecting right now. We still see sin, death, brokenness, all those kinds of things. But on the flip side, we see healing and redemption, restoration, salvation. And we see the, the uh, confrontation of two ages against one another. As we Christians are living according to the age to come. We live by a different standard and a different kingdom. But we are still living in this age. So there's this intersection between the two of them. And that is why the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Okay. It's already because Jesus has been resurrected, but it is not yet because it has not been finally consummated. Make sense? So when we're talking about the kingdom of God here, Jesus is, kind, is trying to show what will be inaugurated and what will be started when he is resurrected. I mean, it's already kind of happening at this time, but he's leading them towards this. And what does he view as the kind of the this ministry? Um, well, we have this amazing moment of the transfiguration, and the transfiguration is a key moment in Jesus' ministry after the confession of him as G as the Christ, after um, him telling his disciples that he must suffer. Then we have this moment of his transfiguration, and <clears throat> the transfiguration we can sometimes think of it as the revelation of Jesus' divinity. But that is not what's happening. The, the transfiguration is not a revelation of Jesus' divinity, but a revelation of his glorious humanity. The way that the early church referred to Jesus and talked about his divinity was not to point to the transfiguration, but it was to point to the crucifixion. If you want to have a picture of what Jesus' divinity is, is most um, honored and exalted, it's when he is lifted up on the cross not when he's transformed on the mountain. Okay. And so it's just an interesting um, thing to consider. But when Moses and Elijah are talking with Jesus on Mount Sinai, or on, not Mount Sinai, on the Mount of Transfiguration, we don't know what mountain it is, what are they talking about? In none of the Gospels does it say what they are talking about, except Luke. Okay, so let's look. Luke chapter thir uh, 9, verses 30 and 31. What does it say that they're talking about? Is the 
departure. Good. So they appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Okay, does that mean that they're just speaking of when he's going to ascend into heaven? Do you guys have any footnotes down there with the word departure? What does it say? Greek exodus. Exodus. The Greek word used for departure is, is the word exodus. It's the word that we title the book of Exodus from. The, the book of Exodus is not called Exodus in the Hebrew Tanakh. The book of Exodus is called These Are the Names. Because the Pentateuch gets their title from the beginning words of each book. So Exodus is called These Are the Names. But the Greek Septuagint titles the book Exodus, which means departure or a way out. Why is that significant? Because the Exodus has characterized Israel's history from the very beginning. This story has been the central story that Israel has lived its whole life around. So central is the Exodus story that Israel's calendar year was reoriented around the Exodus. New Year's Eve. You think of us, New Year's Eve, there's this build up to a brand new year, resolutions, I can start over, everything's new. Think of all of those feelings, but you have that at Easter. It's a brand new year, Passover, the same time as Easter. Right? Every single year. Every year is a brand new start. And all of that, every single year, is looking towards the future of God's great exodus of his people. Right? So Jesus' ministry is not just here to come and die for your sins. Right? We, we've heard that, right? Jesus came and he died for your sins, right? That's, that's often the gospel we preach to people. Is that all Jesus came to do? Is that even the main thing he came to do? Restoration of relationship, right? That, that's one of the main things, restoration of relationship so that people can live according to the kingdom of God. So that avenue is through the death for sins, the payment for sins, right? But that's not the whole gospel. Okay. If that was the whole gospel, then Jesus died at the wrong festival. He should have died at the Day of Atonement if his whole ministry was about the death and payment for sins. Right? When does he die? Passover. Jesus dies at Passover. It is significant for us because of the fact of what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay my life down. So Jesus chose when he was going to die. He chose at what feast he would die, and that should be significant for us, because if it was only for sins, then he should have died at the Day of Atonement. But instead, he dies at Passover, because his ministry is bigger than payment for sins. His ministry is about creating a new family, about making a new people, about setting a people in a reflection of himself so that he might deliver them from the oppressor that is sin, and might bring them to become the family of God so that they can live in his kingdom today. And you, you can parallel these stories. I mean, Moses comes with all these great grand signs. What are all the purposes of the plagues in the book of Exodus? Exodus chapter 9, God says to Pharaoh, if I wanted to kill you, I could have done it. The purpose of the plagues is not to kill people. The purpose of the plagues is that they might know who God is. And that's what, that's what God says to them. And when he says that, then, that comes true later on. You run into Rahab, and Rahab is like, we know what you, your God did at the Red Sea. Right? The, the desire of God had come to fulfillment. So, in the same way, Jesus' miracles demonstrate who the Father is. And as Jesus' miracles demonstrate who the Father is, they've come to know him in that same way. Right? My desire is that you would know who I am. And then, after being freed... From this oppression, Moses leads the people to the edge of the Red Sea. And Jesus basically leads the people away from oppression to the edge of the Red Sea. And when Moses said, when he says, there's no other way, God says, raise up your hands and see the miracle I will perform for you. The Red Sea parts. Israel passes through the Red Sea on dry land, comes out on the other side. And Pharaoh's army and chariots are washed away by the Red Sea. From there, they proceed to Mount Sinai. It's at Mount Sinai they receive the law and how to live for God. We know the law was not given for salvation, right? Israel has not had special salvation at any point in their history. 
The law was not given for salvation. The law was given for representation. How did people get saved in the Old Testament? It wasn't by obedience to the law. The book of Romans and the book of Galatians will make that very clear to you. The point of the law was not salvation. The point of the law was representation. People have always been saved by faith. That's the point of the story of Abraham. David is used as an example as well. Faith has always saved people. Okay? So, they receive the law so that they might know how they can live for God and be his representatives on the earth. In the same way, does Jesus raise up his arms on the cross to make a way so that we might pass through the Red Sea of his blood and coming out on the other side of baptism through his death, our sin is washed away in the Red Sea of his blood. Our oppressor is washed away so that we might come to the mountain of God to receive the law of God, not written on tablets of stone, but written on the flesh of our hearts, so that we might live as the kingdom people and kingdom family of God on the earth today, looking towards the promised land that God is bringing us to. And like Peter says at the beginning of 1 Peter, we are sojourners on this earth to reach that promised land. Right? And in the interim period, we are representatives of God's kingdom. And this is what Jesus was doing through his life and ministry. When he talks about Exodus, it's not just him talking about a past story. This is everything Israel was hoping for. They weren't looking for an Exodus from sin. They were looking for an Exodus from the Romans. But Jesus will bring deliverance to the oppressor that has oppressed them from the very beginning. This is the key to Jesus' ministry, is an Exodus for the new family of God. So the first nine chapters of this book are highlighting the unique identity of Jesus. I'm going to kind of cruise through these things a little bit. You don't have to write all this stuff down, but just to highlight some stuff. So we see the unique identity of Jesus. We see his unique birth, his unique qualifications for ministry, his unique power and authority, his unique titles, son of God, son of man, son of David, Christ, and so on, and then his unique fulfillment of scripture. Um, we have some direct quotations and fulfillments and so many illusions that take place through this portion. Um, we as well will see um, the unique identification given to Jesus where he will be called the Son of the Most High and Christ the Lord. And then um, God at Jesus' baptism, you're my Son in whom I am well pleased. We see as well Jesus uh, being reported about by various people. The scribes and the Pharisees say, who is this man who can forgive sins? The, uh, John the Baptist will say, you are the one. Uh, are you the one who is to come? The Pharisees' guests, guests <coughs> ask, who is this who even forgives sins? The apostles, who is this? Who, uh, he commands even the winds and the waters. Herod Antipas, who then is this I hear such things about? Jesus says, who do you say I am? Or who do the crowd say I am? And then to the apostles, who do you say I am? So we see all these questions about identity. And then the official answer to these questions both come in chapter 9 at the conclusion of this portion before Jesus progresses towards Jerusalem, where it will be said that Jesus is the Messiah confessed on behalf of the apostles by Peter. And then at the crucifixion, where God will announce himself that Jesus is my son in whom I have chosen and tells them to listen to him. Okay. So this is the first nine chapters. <clears throat> We're just going to kind of cruise through this um, topic of prayer and then um, hit on parables and that will probably get us to the end of our time here. So when we look at prayer, uh, prayer in the Gospel of Luke is modeled as the essential response of faith in a person's life. We see that Jesus prays about his ministry in many places. He teaches his disciples to pray. And <clears throat> Jesus is seen as praying for Peter. He tells people to pray for his enemies. And he prays for himself. There are um, parables that Jesus tells about prayer. The friend who comes at midnight to ask for bread. The unjust judge and the, the woman who continues to ask to the judge, the Pharisee and the tax collector, who both come to God 
um, and seek for justification. And so what we see are passages that both encourage and direct prayer, but also warn us about wrong-hearted prayer. We as well see that there are many examples of prayer in this gospel, um, and that prayer defines an individual's relationship with God. Right? Conversing with God, um, not just speaking to him, but listening to him as well. Prayer is central to the ministry of Jesus and the apostles throughout the book of Luke and Acts. So pay attention. Um, pay, prayer is one of those repeated themes in Luke and in Acts that Luke is carrying on through this whole uh, story, these 60 years of early Christian history. From Jesus' prayers uh, at the beginning of his ministry to the first missionary journey in Acts 13 that is prompted by prayer, uh, that is central to the apostles and to Jesus' ministry. Were Jews and then Christians the only ones who prayed? No. The world um, and any religion prayed. They spent time in prayer, um, talking to God, um, or talking to their gods, but their prayers were always formulaic, uh, chanted, and or chant, formulaic, and or, uh, not and or, they could be chanted as well as being formulaic, and they are always manipulative. Okay. It is always about bribery. It's always about bartering with the gods. There is not any heartfelt prayers. In fact, as far as we have ever discovered, there has never been a single prayer discovered in antiquity of anybody trying to do the will of the gods. There's no one who is seeking the will of Zeus to do the will of Zeus. There's no one who's seeking Aphrodite to find out what her will is, or Neptune to find out what his will is. Every existent prayer is always for protection, for manipulation. If I do this for you, you do this for me, or I have this against you, so you have to do this for me. There's, it's those types of prayers. Right? I know your secret name, and so you have to listen to me type things. And so all of the prayers of the ancient world are very different from what, how Jesus teaches his apostles to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. So what we see then for the prayers of the ancient world is they are all self-motivated and self-directed. Where um, the prayers that we're shown to pray um, in here um, are not just for ourselves, but for others as well. And that God is truly looking at the heart motivation of each person coming to him. Prayers are not about eloquence and they are not about volume. The prayers that God hears and receives are the ones that are motivated from a right heart. And so when the Pharisee comes before the Father at the temple and prays, he can go on and on and on in prayer for everybody to hear and will not be heard by his Father in heaven. Or the tax collector can come seeking repentance and is contrite before God and will be heard by him and he is the one who Jesus says will go away justified so let us not be deceived into ever thinking that the more grand that someone's prayer is the better it is we can kind of feel that way sometimes when you listen to somebody pray and you're like dang that person prays so good it doesn't matter before God what matters before God is the heart in prayer not the eloquence that other people hear one of the most classic Christian prayers is to uh, cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the one breath prayer, and is one of the oldest Christian prayers. And so this is a, another theme to, to be aware of and think about, is prayer in this gospel. And to consider how, how do we pray? And when we are praying, are we only talking to God, or are we taking time to listen to him as well? So let's uh, take a look at parables. Uh, 
Parables are an important literature type to discuss because they occur so often in the Gospels. And Luke has more parables than any of the other Gospels. <clears throat> and it has been said by various uh, literary scholars of ancient scripture that parables are the often the second most misinterpreted genre of literature in the Bible, second to Revelation. Um, and they're often misinterpreted because people are looking allegorically at parables. They're looking for hidden meanings and deeper understanding, and they're not understanding how parables should be read um, and how to take them. Uh, Luke's gospel will uh, contains many, many parables, and they're mostly focused in chapters 10 through 20, where there are found 16 full-length story parables. So I've, uh, in my Bible, I have highlighted or boxed in all of the parables in a yellow box, and uh, they pick up in abundance uh, in those middle chapters, between chapters 10 and 20. So just as something that can help you to identify those. Um, <clears throat> the misinterpretation of parables, or this kind of allegorical interpretation, can be traced back to the parable of the sower. Um, the early church used this standard of allegorization of parables to interpret all of the parables so that when they see Jesus interpreting this parable in seemingly allegorical language they then find the freedom to do that with any parable and try to seek out a deeper hidden meaning that would have never been understood by Jesus or it would have been understood by Jesus' first listeners for example, Augustine allegorizes the parable of the Good Samaritan to talk about the origins of sin and the church and then the ministry of the Spirit of God and the church for all future times. Okay. So, for example, he will refer to the, uh, the Samaritan, <clears throat> the Good Samaritan as Jesus, the two coins that he gives to the innkeeper as the Old and the New Testament, and the innkeeper who takes the coins as Paul the Apostle who takes in and cares for this beaten up man. So those are just some elements. You can look up the full allegorization of the story and uh, Augustine gets quite out there with his uh, interpretation on this. What this ends up doing is distorting what Jesus is actually trying to do through the parable. Okay. And when we allegorize parables, we often miss the initial point that the speaker is trying to communicate to help the listeners understand what he is teaching them. So we don't want to disregard the context. In fact, the context is our most helpful tool in understanding parables. Who is Jesus talking to? What are they going through? And how does this relate to their situation? Most of the time, the very uh, immediate preceding story or the immediate post story will give light to why Jesus is telling the parable and what it is all about. <clears throat> so, parables uh, themselves are the most easy to understand from the shoes of the audience, or the sandals of the audience in this case. And the reason that we know the parables are fairly straightforward and easy to understand is because the audience gets them. The fact that the audience reacts to Jesus' parables shows that they understand. Okay. Now, we just won't be able to understand parables the same way as the audience did because we are so separated by culture. And we'll explain that here in just a moment. But the, the word parable, um, parabole in Greek and mythol in Aramaic, means riddles, parables, or puzzles. It's kind of these uh, extended similes. Okay? So these are not metaphors. Uh, but something is like something else, not something is something else. So a metaphor um, does not use like or as, a simile uses like or as. So when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, blah, 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 right? It is an extended simile, not an extended metaphor. So Jesus is not trying to replace the kingdom of God with something else. A metaphor is something like God is a rock. Well, no, he's not. He is a spiritual being. Okay? He's not a rock, right? That's a metaphor, right? Um, it is a more emphatic simile. Okay. So in this case, um, we are just dealing with similes. Different types of parables. We have story parables. These are often referred to as true parables, as these are extended stories 
trying to prove a point. And these are quite common in the Gospels. Um, the Good Samaritan is one example of this, um, or the tale of two sons, which we often call the prodigal son, uh, but the story is really about two sons. The next is similitudes, and similitudes are illustrations from everyday life, something like the mustard seed, or leaven inside of flour, or dough. Or you do have metaphors from time to time. These are much more brief, where you will have something like you are the salt of the earth. Well, none of us are actually salt. Right? Um, we, uh, Jesus is using a metaphor, of course. These function like similitudes in some ways, but um, are, are usually very um, short and brief, where a similitude may go a little longer. Okay. The next uh, is an epigram. This is the, the fourth type of um, saying that fits into the parable uh, subgenre. <clears throat> and so one example would be, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Sometimes these can be a little bit allegor or can seem to be allegorical, but the details are intended to represent something else, where um, they are symbolic, but allegorical will, will say that the initial literal meaning of the story was not the intention but it is the deeper meaning that was intended. So if you're getting something from the surface level of the story, that is not the intention of the parable. That's what allegory will teach. So we're not looking to allegorize these, we're just looking to um, look at the surface. What is it actually saying? So when we think of the purpose of parables, why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, we have his saying specifically, where he'll say he, he is uh, speaking in parables so that those who listen, um, may not understand, those who see, or those who are, um, yeah, hear, may not hear, and see, may not see. So Jesus is speaking in parables seemingly to hide things from people, but in light of what, I, the quote from Isaiah in chapter 6 that Jesus is quoting from, is that Jesus isn't doing this so that people will not understand, he's doing this so that those who actually see will see, right, those who have eyes to see will see. And in this, the purpose that Jesus is communicating these parables is to call for a response from his listeners. So those who see, those that hear, that they must respond in some way. And we see the fact that they do react to Jesus' parables, that they understand the response. They understand they're supposed to do something. <clears throat> so parables are really there for illustrations and calling forth a response from his hearers and they're supposed to respond to Jesus' ministry. The greatest dilemma for interpreting parables for us is that we will never fully receive them like they were written. And the reason is, is because parables function like jokes. Okay? When you hear a joke, it is not the understanding of the joke that makes you laugh. Right? It is the immediacy of the joke. Right? It, it is that in that moment you get caught and something is funny. Right? It's, it's not that you can explain and understand and you, you know everything because someone can tell it to you. It's because you understand everything at such a deep level that it instantly catches you. Right? When you have to explain a joke to somebody, they know what they should have laughed at. Right? They know why it's funny, but they're not going to laugh because that those truths are not part of who they are at the deepest level. Okay. So parables in that way are like jokes. To Jesus' listeners, they understand. It's part of their culture. It's part of who they are. And when Jesus says something, they instantly respond because it's part of them. For us, we know what we should laugh at. We know why we should laugh. But we generally will not laugh at the parables or what I should say, we will not react to the parables the way that was intended. Okay, so at that, in that place, we are always at a disadvantage of the real impact of parables. Nobody is in the place to truly react to the parables the way that Jesus and first listeners were, simply because we are not present in that culture two thousand years ago, and nobody is today. Right, no matter how similar it is we will not catch the parables the same way. 
Something is often is funny because there's an unexpected turn. And so this is what you want to pay attention to. What is the response that Jesus expects? Where is the unexpected turn? Where the story is going in one direction and it suddenly turns, takes a 90 degree left or right, and suddenly is in a different place. That is often what we laugh at in a joke. So what is the unexpected turn in the parable? Where you would <gasps> gasp because something happens. So, the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? You have the Levite, and you have um, the Pharisee who comes along, um, or sorry, the priest and the Levite um, who comes along, and then you're expecting the Pharisee. That's the third. That's what you expect to come along in the Good Samaritan story. And then Jesus says, and then came along a Samaritan. Everybody's like, what? Like, are you serious right now? Like, that is not the way the parable was going. Or, when the um, the, par- the parable of the two sons and the father, the, the son after spending all the father's inheritance comes back to the father and the father sees the son coming from far off, your expectation in the story is, and he rebuked him and made him work for him the rest of his life yeah. and when the father runs out to the son, everybody's like Are you kidding me right now? Like it is caught it's an unexpected turn in that moment. Like, that is not the way things were supposed to go, right? Or when a shepherd who has 99 sheep loses one, he just lets that one go. That's nothing to him, right? That's the way the story should go. One sheep out of 99 is nothing. It is not worth the shepherd's time. It is an unexpected turn where the shepherd goes and finds that one sheep and leaves the 99. Okay, so those are the type of unexpected turns. How can you know who this is supposed to affect? Well, look at the audience. Who is Jesus talking to? Who is in the audience? How are they, what do you know about these people? Their lifestyle, their values, their thoughts. What do you know about those people? And from identifying them, you can understand a lot of what you should be thinking about in the parable. Um, and so you want to look at those points of reference, the key elements of the parable. Who is the parable about? What is the point of the parable? Um, and so that's uh, for those there. So I'm not going to take time to go through these two stories. I've talked about them a little bit with the turn and the audience um, and the people in the stories. But these are two classic ones to kind of go through uh, as they're very easy, straightforward, and all the elements are quite visible. So I'm going to put up a number of um, thoughts here uh, or on the next slide that I think it'll be helpful. Um, with questions, but there is some thoughts on like, well, what do we do with context, uh, contextless parables, these parables where uh, we don't know what's going on. Simply read it over and over and over, okay? The more familiar you are with the parable, the easier it will be to identify what the point is or who the parable was, would have been intended to be spoken to, okay? Um, <clears throat> Understanding the points of reference and considering the hearers, you know, how would this have impacted people? Um, the next kind of parable that we're going to see quite a bit is this. The kingdom parables are pretty consistent, and Jesus will say this phrase, the kingdom of God is like, but usually we're not supposed to take like the first element as the kingdom of God, but the implication of the whole. And so you could rephrase this with, it is like this with the kingdom of God. Right? That's the kind of way to format these parables. It is like this with the kingdom of God, and Jesus will explain what it is like. So Jesus isn't comparing the kingdom of God to something, but the ways of the kingdom of God. So the parables are a vehicle used by Jesus to invite people in a call towards greater levels of discipleship and obedience. And the most important thing for us with parables, they are supposed to call for a response. The parables are all about how we are supposed to respond to them. That's what we're looking for in the parables. So these are some questions for us here, just to think about. You know, someone can take a picture and probably share it in your group chat. Who is the audience? Right? When you come to the parables asking, who is listening to Jesus as he's talking about this story? What's the context? What, what's the situation? Is Jesus at a dinner? Is he just being questioned by Pharisees? Has someone asked him about the law or how to be obedient? Or 
who is my neighbor? You know, what is the context? What's the situation that it's presented in? And then the points of reference in a parable, right? Those key things that who is in the parable? What is the unexpected turn or surprise in the story? And then who gets caught? When you listen to the story, who would listen to the, who is it that's listening to the story and suddenly gets caught in the story unexpectedly or confronted? Um, and then what is the response that's called for? And what response is actually made by the audience? We will kind of look at one of these when we get into, I think, um, the, the Good Samaritan parable. Uh, well, I can, I can say here, for the Good Samaritan parable, you see this man who's trying to justify himself about his obedience to the law. It's one of these lawyers or scribes who comes to Jesus and says, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, oh, love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, um, uh, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, good job. You, that is, that's the right answer, you know? And you think he'd be content there, right? He comes to Jesus, and if you heard that from Jesus, he'd be like, all right, great, going away, right? That's all I need. But this man, desiring to justify himself, says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't tell him who his neighbor is, right? It would be much easier to say, your neighbor is everybody around you, which is, might be how we would tell somebody. Well, who is my neighbor? Everybody around you. Pretty simple, straightforward. Instead, Jesus says, let me tell you a story. And he tells him a story. And at the, store, at the end of the story, Jesus doesn't say, so the Samaritan was the man's neighbor. Jesus says, who was a neighbor to the man? He invites the man to respond. Okay. Now, what is his response? Many of you notice that at the end of the story, chapter 10, verse 37. Who was the neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? What does it say? The one who showed him mercy. Yeah, exactly. What does the lawyer not say? The lawyer does not say the Samaritan, mm -hmm. which shows you how much contempt he has in his heart for this race of people that he cannot even say the Samaritan showed him mercy. He has to say the man who showed him mercy was his neighbor. Right. I mean, you think of it like this. You know, if there was a man down on Lee Drive, a homeless man who's down by the, that little beach down there, a little sand spot. You, uh, <clears throat> you're walking to class, you went and you got a coffee down uh, by Kona Inn, and you're walking back to class, you see this homeless man there, and um, as you're, you're sitting on the wall, you've observed this guy, and um, you see Brett Curtis walking from a meeting, uh, and he sees this homeless guy and crosses over the street and walks on the other side over to ships. And then, as you keep watching, you see Philip walking down the street, probably from the same meeting with Brett, and he sees that homeless man beaten up on the side of the road, not sure if he's even alive or if he's dead, and Philip also crosses onto the other side of the street and, and walks up to shifts. He's got a meeting to be at, he can't be late, so I've got a class started for you guys. Who knows why you're there late? But, uh, but as you're watching, you see a man dressed in orange, come up to him, shaved head, just sandals on his feet, an orange sash around him, and takes this man down uh, to the King Cam, buys him a hotel room, puts him up there and says, here's my credit card, keep it on file, keep this man here as long as you need. And that monk, that monk goes off to his Buddhist temple to offer his prayers and to spin his wheel and to meditate. Who was the neighbor to the man? The monk. Not the one you want it to be. Right? You don't want the monk to be the neighbor to the man. You want it to be Philip or Brett Curtis or Sean Murphy. Right? You want the neighbor to be the one that you think it should be, the one you expect or the one you hope. Right? The next person that you would expect to walk down there might be Raymond. Right? Raymond walks up, takes care of the man, brings him down to King Cam. The parables are meant to confront you with something you're not expecting and something that makes you uncomfortable. That's not the way the story should go. Okay. 
So that's what we want to pay attention to. Here. Okay. So when you look at these parables, paying attention to these types of things, and then what's the timeless truth and the application can be made uh, is just something to then take it for our own response into our own lives. Any questions on parables? I will hit on some of them. Most of them are pretty straightforward, especially when you pay attention to these things. So, yeah. Okay. So the I'm just going to hit on some things from chapter 10, and then we will wrap up here. <clears throat> All right. So in chapter 10, uh, as Jesus is heading off towards Jerusalem, he sends out the 72, which again is something only in the book of Luke. And in sending off the 72, this is paralleled to the 72... Um, people who were anointed in the book of Numbers to prophesy. You remember reading that story in Numbers, maybe, um, where these 70 people come to Moses, and they are all given the ability to prophesy and to be kind of leaders in the camp of Israel. And then Joshua runs to Moses and says, Moses, there's two men still prophesying in the camp. What does Moses say? Go get them. We're going to beat them up. Now he says, go get, uh, go, uh, he says, I wish that everybody in Israel would prophesy. Right? He says, leave them be. Right? Let, them, let them prophesy. So in the same kind of way, Jesus is sending out these 72 who are going to be ministers to him, announcers of his kingdom, to go out and are kind of the assistants in this new exodus, the same way as these 72 were for Moses in the book of Numbers. Now we have this story of Mary and Martha, again, only in Luke. And this story is a beloved story of those who like to talk about intimately sitting and gazing at Jesus and sitting at his feet. But <clears throat> this, this story, I will suggest, is misinterpreted through that lens or is not given the full weight when it is interpreted through that lens. Now, we know that these two women are sisters. We see that from the Gospel of John. And so there is a bit of a family dynamic here between Martha, who invites Jesus to her house, and Mary, who's just sitting at Jesus' feet. And we often paint it as Martha is just uh, distracted with all the busyness of the house, and you know, she's taking care of all these logistical things, and Mary is choosing to be at Jesus' feet and um, focus on him. And we tend to say then, you know, don't focus on all these other thing tasks that need to get done, but rather focus on Jesus um, and spend time quietly at his feet. And uh, that, I think, it doesn't give the full value to Martha, which Jesus is not trying to do in this setting. Um, and it uh, says that doing, it, it implies that doing work for Jesus is not as valuable as being with Jesus, where Jesus never gives that air. Right? Jesus doesn't give the, the presentation that doing things for the kingdom of God is less valuable than spending time with him. Now, we tend to have that perspective. It is more valuable just to be in the presence of God than it is to do things for the kingdom of God. But that is not what Jesus is trying to teach here. What is happening is a breaking of cultural boundaries. In this culture, Men and women were always separated. The only time that husbands and wives really came together was in private and uh, in the bedroom. So when they were just in the house by themselves or uh, in the bedroom together. So women were in one portion of the house and men were in another portion of the house. So if there's a bunch of men over, all the women are together in, in the kitchen or in another room area and the men are in another room. But what we have here is Jesus with his group of disciples and now Mary is coming to join them. She is crossing over a cultural boundary that is unacceptable. And what is she doing? She's coming and she, in the cultural setting, she is acting like a man. She is doing what only men were permitted to do. And she's sitting at Jesus' feet. What does it mean to sit at somebody's feet? Good. There's only one other time in the whole Bible that this phrase is used. It's also used by Luke as an author, and it is on the lips of Paul. In Acts chapter 22, Paul will tell us that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was his teacher, his disciple. And so what we see here then is Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus as a disciple and a learner of Jesus. 
And Jesus is not rebuking her. He is accepting her as an equal status amongst men in a culture that only permitted men to learn educationally and only permitted men as disciples of rabbis. And now Jesus is including her. And Mary is saying to, or Martha is saying to Jesus, you are doing what should not be done. Mary should be in here with the other women. You shouldn't be letting Mary do what she's doing right now. And Jesus says to Martha, Mary has chosen a good thing. Right. He is saying, you have to, uh, you need to accept where she's at right now. She's breaking these social, uh, cultural boundaries, these social boundaries, um, and Jesus is allowing her to do that. She's not doing it for the sake of just breaking culture, but she's doing it to set an example of equality in the kingdom of God. And this story is incredibly powerful for Jesus' acceptance of female disciples. And we diminish it by only giving Mary credit for being intimate with Jesus. That is not what it's about. She wants to be a learner, and she wants to preach the kingdom of God. And that's why she's there. So let's not diminish the value of stories like this with simple interpretations that uh, don't give the full weight of the cultural environment. <clears throat> and I think it's, a, it's an amazing thing, right? What we see in Luke as well, earlier on um, in chapter... Uh, eight at the very beginning is that Jesus was primarily supported by women. That his ministry team, his support team, was mostly women who were taking care of him and providing for the needs of him and probably the 12 apostles. Uh, and that uh, Jesus gives incredible credit to them. So that, as well as the fact that um, women are the first ones at the tomb and they are the ones carrying the gospel, gives the most credit to the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that story was on the lips of Peter or John or James, then it would not have been as credible historically as if it is on the lips of a woman. Why? Because a woman's testimony in the first century is not accepted in the court of law as valid. If a woman witnesses a crime and she is brought as a witness into a court of law, that crime would have been expunged because of the fact that her witnessing of that crime is not worth peanuts in court. So, to give the testimony of the resurrection on the lips of a handful of women validates the story itself because the church was not willing to compromise the truth of the event by putting it into the lips of a more credible witness. And so the church stuck with a story that was true, but tarnished their reputation. And that has been one of the greatest points of validation for the resurrection, is that the testimony went against all cultural boundaries and standards. And so what we see um, with women in the Gospels is, uh, inside of their ancient cultural context, is a huge shift in value is a huge shift in honor and care and consideration of equal inclusion and status, right? where there is an equality amongst them in the ministry of Jesus' disciples. And I think that's a good point for us to wrap up today. So I'll pray, and then we will be done. So Lord, we thank you so much for this book, for all that it's teaching us, Lord, and for um, the amazing stories, God, that we see in here, the, the challenges that we receive, God, the confrontation that this book is, I pray, Lord, that uh, we would respond, Jesus, um, in obedience to it, God. Would we respond to the convictions that you're placing on our heart, Lord, and take it seriously. Lord, we thank you so much for, for this gospel, for you, Jesus, who has come to bring us through this exodus so that we might live in the kingdom of God. And I pray, Lord, that um, as this class goes through Luke and looks at your kingdom and looks at how you lived and the example that you set, that their minds would be not just on the things that you had done that we highlight all the time and talk about, but to think about the implications of what you had done. Holy Spirit, would you remind them of these things to give them a broader picture of what you did, Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're so grateful. 
so honored to follow your footsteps that you modeled for us. God, would you bless this class as they dive into your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Any, are there any questions? Anything? Yeah. You can go uh, I just had one while uh, doing paragraph titles yesterday. Yeah. Um, in chapter 8, I just wanted to see what your kind of uh, sure. opinion on something was. Uh, when he's casting out the uh, pigs, yeah, uh, he's casting out the legion to the pigs. They a they ask him not to be departed into the abyss, and then he like it almost is like he listens to them and sends them to the pigs instead. And I found that interesting. In yeah. What? I don't know what. Sure. What might the abyss be, and why wouldn't he cast them there if he could, and like keep them part of the yeah the material world? Or... <clears throat> I you know I. Uh... I don't really know. <laughs> um, but I do think, like, Jesus isn't keeping his enemies around, you know, that kind of thing. Like, we had talked about, like, these kind of wild spirits. Yeah. Like, it's not necessarily the servants of Satan as much as it is just, like, these spirits who are out there. So um, that that seems to me to be more the scenario of what it is. Um, uh, the abyss probably is the final destination of judgment for all that stands opposed to God in any way. So, um, yeah. But... I don't know why he sends it into the pigs. Uh, you know, and then the pigs just run off and kill themselves. Just, I mean, just do, how they begged him, and then he like, okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so many questions around the story because of the fact as well that Jesus like basically robs the livelihood of these shepherds or these people who are caring for the pigs. They have two thousand pigs, <laughs> and they all die. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not like Jesus going around trying to make friends with everybody. <laughs> Like those guys, I am sure, like the rest of their lives, you wouldn't have believed what happened to me. This one time this guy got off a boat and he killed all my pigs. You know, every one of them. You know, like they would be so mad. And they probably have bitterness the rest of their life. Unless, you know, unless that demon possessed man, they see him later on, hear the gospel from him, right? Jesus sends him out as the first missionary. He's the first guy in all the gospels that he says, go and tell people about what has been done to you. Everybody else, he says, be quiet. Right? And implicationally, because of the place this man is at, he's probably a Gentile. So it's like the first missionary that Jesus sends out could potentially be a Gentile. And he goes out, uh, and so who knows, maybe those shepherds got saved by this guy. But, uh, but anyways, it's a question to ask Jesus when we see him. You know, like, what about those guys? You know, like, did you redeem that at all? Yeah. Not every one of his miracles is... Uh, a blessing. <laughs> also, could you just recap on uh, the kingdom of God? Um, just more of a one sentence. Please. Yeah. Um, I think the the simplest way I, I like to explain it is the, the kingdom of God is where God is king and his subjects live in accordance with his king, with his rules or with his uh, instruction and so Jesus tries to lay out what that is like and what the instructions what the example is you know like loving your enemies being generous mourning with those who mourn like all those things that are very countercultural. cultural um, that's, that's what it means so that's when I say like instructions or the rules of the kingdom those are the things I'm implying with that and so Jesus is saying like the kingdom, and, and he's confronting it because their idea of the kingdom is like a ruthless overthrowing of the Romans. And when Jesus comes along and he says, the kingdom of God is like leaven and dough. You're never going to see it, and you're not going to know it's there until the impact of the leaven uh, affects the dough. And it's like, you won't see the kingdom of God. You won't know the kingdom of God is there, but you will see the impact of the kingdom of God among society. And like a mustard seed, the kingdom of God although tiny, although insignificant, will leave a dramatic impact upon the environment around it. Good. 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 No, I'm going to save my question. Okay. I want a longer response. So. Um, <laughs> you were talking about the, um, his years of ministry. You said it could be three or one. Yeah. What's your personal opinion on it? Mm, I think it's three years. Three years? Yeah. I think three year uh, I, I think the three year ministry of Jesus is uh, justifiable.
All right. Over you guys. sharing your wealth of knowledge with us, and I'm sure that there's lots of new revelation. How many people learned something new today? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I learned so many new things today. So, um, yeah, thank you for your time, and um, is there just like maybe one person that just wants to share quickly something that they were impacted by today? Yes, Kylie. <laughs> oh my gosh, the um, Martha and Mary thing, I'm like, my mind is like blown. That was really good. <laughs> so many, I feel like, I, every time it's Mother's Day at church, it's Martha and Mary, and it's like spend time with Jesus, and like don't, you know, like just all that, and that just like completely blew my mind because it, that's such a surface level like way to interpret it, like you were saying, and like completely missing what Jesus was actually trying to do, and that's so wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I add one thing <coughs> as well? The the passages that often seem to be inhibitive of women actually speak volumes into the permission that is given in the culture. So for example, um, when you read, let a woman learn in silence, it feels a little bit oppressive, right? Yeah. But when you're in a culture that never allows women to learn, mm. saying let them learn <laughs> is huge. <laughs> yeah. You know? But then you think, well, let them learn in silence, and you're like, that's a little bit oppressive. Like, why would you say that? how else are you supposed to learn? <laughs> you know, like, if someone's talking and constantly argumentative and constantly responding to what the teacher's saying, it's not a good learning environment. Mm -hmm. Who likes to be in a learning environment that's not silent? Mm -hmm. You know, silence is a learning, good learning environment. So it's like, let women learn in silence. And you're like, that's offensive to, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's really nice, you know, so, yeah. Tomorrow. Perfect, yeah, tomorrow, 9.15.